You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Shit, let's just get right into it. Yeah, um, so yes, the, I guess let's just reiterate it. So how did you two meet? How did this relationship form? Yeah, so basically... I hit him up on Facebook because he called a giant somewhere that we'll, we'll call it an undisclosed location. And it was a nice fish. And I was trying to pick his brain about it. And he was like, I guess he scrolled through the page and was like, oh man, you make jigs. He was like, let me get 40 of these jig skirts. Cause it was a color I made specifically for the lower Potomac. What did I, it was like Potomac crawl or something like that. Potomac crawl or your blue crab, something like one of those something. two. It was mm-hmm. like a mix of uh, like blues and green pumpkins and with some orange in it. It was, yeah. it was a really good lower Potomac color and that's his bread and butter. So he was like, gotta have these things. Three days later, he's sending me pictures of fish he's catching on. And so I was like, all right, yeah, we're friends now. <laughs> <laughs> and then how did you get into fishing? Uh, my old man has tournament fished since I was born. Um, he got us into, myself and my brother, into junior clubs when i was probably about 10 or 12 and ever since then just been hooked we did junior clubs i can't remember the name of it's in uh what is that hagerstown area but anyways um we fished those i got into the junior sqts and i've just been hooked it's been non-stop i haven't stopped tournament fishing since then um the past few years especially fishing with him it's just really became an addiction it's it's kind of sickening at this point how bad it's gotten. Now, do you still have, do you still like fish out of a boat in the front of the boat or are you just a co-angler now? Cause you said it was your dad's boat, right? Well, or... at the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, right now I have my own boat. We kind of switch back and forth. Gotcha. Um, my boat's kind of turdish. So sometimes I'm fishing in the back of the boat. Other times, you know, I'm leading the, leading the hurrah there. So we're that nineties tracker squad out yeah, there. Yeah. So then who was your team partner before you two got together? Uh, it's just always been my old man. Okay. I, gotcha. I've been tournament fishing with him since. I was probably eight, nine years old. You know what I mean? Just fishing, even open tournaments and stuff like that. I've always fished with him. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I really wish my dad fished. My dad yeah. does not do any <laughs> outdoor activities yeah. like that. And for me, I mean, growing up, that was uh, my buddy Kurt that I've talked about on here before. He kind of filled that role, like, because my dad never tournament fished. Mm. He started me young fishing, and we watched Bassmasters religiously every weekend it was on, but he never took the step into the tournament fishing. And then once I hit about high school, uh, Kurt was his best friend. And then me and him became best friends because I showed an interest and I actually joined a club in high school. And ever since then, I mean, any open tournament, you know, local Potomac teams, whatever, me and Kurt just, we get in the boat, either his boat or my boat and we go. So it kind of filled that gap to where that was like my shoe into the tournament world, uh, which is a good point. I mean, we both grew up club fishing. We both were part of really good clubs and both in the Hagerstown, Maryland area. And actually, the club I'm in now, uh, Antietam Bassmasters, they're the oldest chaptered Bassmaster club in Maryland at this point. Um, if if you're a young angler, like uh, his brother-in-law, I just got him in my club this year. He's 19. Nice. He's never fished tournaments before. So if you're a young angler and you're looking to step into this world, club tournaments are an excellent way to do that. You know, everybody is friendly. You know, everybody's there. Because steel sharp and steel. I know we've all mm-hmm. heard that. So... You, you you're a young angler and you want to step into this world so you get in the boat with guys that have done it for years and years and years on a small scale to get comfortable with it because you know i'm sure you had the same thing i'm sure he did too the first tournament you ever get in a boat your freaking heart is just thumping oh, like yeah, well, hey it still does yeah I mean, you and know it's I mean? the like, fun like, of it when that it, shit goes away is when i quit doing it yeah like and that's what's fun about like guys you say like I know I get a lot of comments about why I'm not fishing tournaments anymore, but like I, I'll get back into it eventually. But man, like when you get out there and you have the camera going, it's the same thing because you don't be like, oh yeah, I fucking suck. I can't catch one now. <laughs> like it's it's the exact same thing. Uh, but like, how many tournament organizations did you guys fish for last year, 2022? Because I do want to do like a little bit of a recap because Chris, I know for you, yeah, it was a hell, it was a fun year. So me and him both fished Potomac teams last year. So I kinda, Potomac teams, uh, Antietam. Uh, Potomac teams, Antietam Bassmasters. <laughs> Uh, Butch Ward Memorial Tournament, which is a really good St. Jude uh, collaborated tournament that a gentleman named Plank Klein puts on every year. It's an awesome tournament because all the proceeds go to St. Jude's. So we fish that. There's uh, early bird thrown together tournament. That's it's kind of like unspoken on the Upper Potomac. Everybody just shows up last Sunday in February. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's never I've advertised. Never, I've never seen an advertisement for it. It's just the same day every year. People just kind of show for up. like the last thirty six <laughs> years. Crazy. It's awesome. 
but that's a good one. But uh, mainly, like our bigger focus last year for, especially for Matt, was the Potomac teams, and I took the club a little more seriously last year. So I mean, you did really good in the club too. Like I mean, you had, I had some three good wins total last year. Yeah, which you know you're fishing against guys that basically I'm in the backyard week in and week out. They fish Deep Creek, Maryland for 40 years. They fish the uh, Lower Potomac for the same amount of time. Well, a lot through. of those places were your first time there, correct? Yeah, Deep Creek. I'd never. Deep Creek, holy shit. Mm-hmm. I got to go out with Matt Sell, the DNR guy. And I go mm-hmm. there, I was like, Jesus Christ. I, I always thought this was just like a place for like pleasure, but I didn't know there was fish in this lake. Yeah. And this place is legit. I mean, after the fish kills, everybody kind of wrote it off, but it's still it's good. Back. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the fact is, like, it's like a fish under every dock there. It's, yeah. it's, it's like, completely different than fishing, like, docks at, like, Anna. And it or, might not be size, but there's fish on every oh, dock. Oh, yeah, like, if you wanted to learn how to dock fish, mm-hmm. like, that's, that's the place, that's the place go to go. You 50,000 in a day if you want. Yeah, and I couldn't believe the grass there. I mean, we were pitching these massive-ass tubes, and, like, I, I stuck two bass that were, like, three and a half, four pounds on these big tubes on grass lines. Like, you would up at, like, Lake Champlain and stuff, mm-hmm. but it's just, it's a really cool place. It's its own beast. It's, yeah, It's it a whole is. different animal, because you can go fish deep water, or you can go to a creek and just flip grass all day and you fished racetown too right that oh, was yeah. a fun tournament yeah racetown was really fun i actually <laughs> got beat at racetown on a fluke and the dude that did it props to him that was awesome because if i was him that would have been the greatest day ever <laughs> he pulled out he told us he pulled up in one tree and caught a it was like a 511 small mouth a 54 large mouth and another one over four out of the same tree within the last 20 minutes he didn't even have a limit up to that point <sighs> you know it's and it, he crushed it I'm free. Dave's the man. If it's your time, it's your time. Exactly. You know what I mean? Because me and my partner had an established pattern all day. We consistently caught nice fish all day long. And we were like, all right, man, you know, they're really going to, you know, the, the cliche, they're really going to have to catch them to beat us. Well, Dave really caught them that day. So so props to Dave. That was awesome. Let's bring that up on the screen. I know you had it somewhere. You had this massive one you caught from uh, Deep Creek. Uh, Are you on my Instagram? Or... Yeah. This is... This is all the I go back up. It's on my other page. How many pages you got? Oh, so I got my fans? personal page, and I have this is my personal, and then I have my fishing page. Uh, so it should be Chris Arvin fishing. Yep, right there. Oh, that makes more sense. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, there, there there should be two on that post to the left, and the second one. So that one was three even. And then if you scroll over one, let me hold on, guys. Let me share it because I just realized I'm not sharing the screen, so you guys can't see shit. There we go. So this fish and the next fish really defined the day for me. Uh, we were kind of having a pretty mediocre day up to this point because Deep Creek tends to be a pickerel and pike hole. There's a lot of them up there. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's absolutely insane. That's a nice that's fish. Deep? No, that's actually from the Upper Potomac. That day I set the club record for weight. How for, big was that fish? Four two. Jesus. That was my first keeper of the day. It set the tone for the rest of the day. And that was all in that uh, the new Berkeley spinnerbait. Actually, mm-hmm. So Berkeley last year came out with the, the their new line of pretty much everything. So it's their little quarter ounce. I think they call it the Power Finesse. Hmm. And the other one I have is Chartreuse and White. I didn't bring it today, but it was the first time that I actually used it and caught fish on it. And the freaking blade is just ate up, which if I was throwing a bigger spinnerbait that day, I wouldn't have caught these fish because that fish hit the spinnerbait three times before I got a hook in it. Really? Because they were keyed in on the blade. So the blade is chewed up, which I've never really had blades on the spinnerbait get chewed like that, but they were keyed in on that blade as opposed to the bait itself. So a lot of them, I mean, I was getting, eventually they would eat the whole thing, but it was, it was a fluke spur of the moment. Uh, it was 10 o'clock. I had one fish for like 12 ounces. The guy in the back of the boat had one fish for like a pound. And it was the pattern that we thought would have won the tournament. And we were like, look, man, I've caught nine fish all day. Most of them were 10 inches. I was like, we got to make a run. And the night before, we had a good rainstorm. So the Apecan Creek up on Big Slack, the mouth of it is right there. So I run up to the mouth, and there's like a good section of like little eddies in there. And the water was dirtier. The rest of the river was gin clear. That water up there was a little dirty. I said we may may have had a foot of visibility. And as soon as I shut the motor down, I was like, all right, I'm picking the spinnerbait up. And I tied it on, and that was the first cast. And then every other fish in the limit was over two pounds, which is unheard of on the upper Potomac. So I had a 4-2 kicker, and everything else mm. was either too even or bigger. So, yeah. Dude, that is, that is awesome. It got to the of... point where he couldn't fish because I was calling for the net because I was only throwing 12-pound tests. 
and in current, you know, the two pound smallmouth fights like a five pound anything else in slack water. Uh huh. And he was like, man. And I offered him spinner baits. I was like, here, I'll give you a rod, a reel, and a spinner bait. I was like, just throw these. But he was committed. He was like, I didn't bring it. It's fine. He was like, I'll just scoop them in the net for you. <laughs> I was like, all right, man. It doesn't sound like fun, but so like walk us through your year then. So like March and April, you have that that first big tournament of the year. Um, so that's where he'll take over because he killed it early in the year. Uh, he he did way better than I did. So um. I wouldn't say way better, but yeah. uh, we got into fishing the Potomac teams, and I think the first tournament, what, end of March? Yeah. So. Um, end of March, uh, go to Lower Potomac for Potomac teams, and that's, at the, I mean, the year started off so awesome. I think we ended up with 17 or 18 pounds, all just chatterbait fishing and grass flats. So so set the tone for this. Like, mm-hmm. is it just you and three other boats at the uh, at the teams? Oh, or like, how, how many were there? Shoot, what, the okay. first one had, like, it was a, 100, I think. Most of them turn out between yeah. 70 and 100 boats. So yeah. it's, it's a sizable field. Yeah. yeah. And you got locals that live there. That it's... I mean, there's some guys that drive from their house and their boat to the boat ramp. I mean, they're, they're yeah. that local. It's, yeah. yeah. You got some impressive hands there. Um, and I think that was one of our coldest cold fronts of the spring. I think we went from 60 degree weather to what, 30 degree nights. We watched and... the temperature just tank. Yeah. It was like 60 and we we're like, all right, man, perfect pre-spawn. And then yeah. the day of the tournament, it was 41 degree water temperature. Yeah. We dropped, yeah, somewhere between. It was like 18, 19 degrees yeah. in a week. It dropped. We went out and pre-fished the week before and we found, I think I had kind of accidentally a 17, 18 pound bag pre-fishing. Uh, we were just, you know, we'd roll up on a spot and everything we caught was three, four pounder. Um, and during this cold front that came through after we were done pre-fishing, we thought, well, it, this is probably a wash. You know what I mean? It, all these fish are going to move, drop back off these flats, and it'll be a rough day. Well, I think the first, second cast of the tournament, we roll in and we catch a, a four-pounder like right off the bat. And after that, it was just one after another. I think we caught 30 or 40 fish in the first hour to hour and a half. And we were dumb enough that once the tide stopped, we decided, well, let's leave. We'll go find them again somewhere else. We fished all day, never found another fish. We rolled back there the last hour of the tournament, and we are having some live well issues. So my uh, tournament partner was working on the live well, and I'm just loading the boat again. I think I caught another 30, 40 on a jackhammer again just just all day long. Or- You're a Potomac local, I think, like me, because like, with your dad being a tournament angler. Mm-hmm. And then I grew up fishing like middle school and high school tournaments, college tournaments. So like, it, it's weird. Like I don't consider myself good at the river, but I've just been there so long. Like yeah. you just learn shit cause you've just been there for like 20 yeah. years. Um, like that has had to have helped you uh, like along the way for your education, your, your river yeah. education. Um, I mean, growing up fishing at a, a junior club, the, the tools that you learn, I would recommend that to anyone, anyone that has kids that are into fishing. It is so unreal how much you learn. I mean, when I started a junior club, I threw a tube. That was it. It was a tube, and if it was in grass, maybe a Senko, if I could remember how to rig a Senko kind of deal. Um, but going through just a junior club alone, I mean, drop shot fishing, crankbait fishing, uh, swim jig was my biggest one. I mean, I live with it. He'll attest to that. That's, it's yeah. nothing but a swim jig. He's the reason there's so many in my box now. Yeah. Really? He converted you? 100%. Wow. I, I've always thrown swim jigs, but not like he did. But yeah, you're like, like you're, all right, there's you're, something to this. You were like branded, you know, jackhammer. Like, you were 100% yeah. like there's a There's 40 of them sitting here. <laughs> that tells yeah, you there. <laughs> yeah, so that, yeah, they don't go away. That's crazy that what? he got you, like, converted a little bit more I think we it. did that a lot, too the past couple years hell i I owned what two jackhammers when we first met and i think i have 40 to 60 of them in here now and you know jerkbait fishing was a big thing we we learned along the way i mean it's it's like going back to the the steel star uh, sharpening steel thing is you know we had two totally different techniques and fishing styles when we first got together like i would have i don't know four or five years ago branded myself as a finesse fisherman i was really good at it and that's what i like to do and i got bites and i was successful at it but now that i've started his style of power fishing, especially when it comes to jerk baits and crank baits, and you know, even watching tactical bass and you know his burn, burn, pause, burn, 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 pause. You know, you get tired of hearing it every video, but that that style of speed fishing has just up the level of my fishing exponentially. And he showed that to me way before I ever started watching tactical bass, and especially with the the style of jerk bait, crank bait fishing. Um, I kind of I don't know. I'd say that I get him out of his comfort zone a lot because yeah. he he loves shallow water. He loves grass. I like hard cover. I like deeper water. So we've kind of taught each other so much along the way, which is a, a make of a good tournament partner. Because if I'm cracking him on a chatterbait, he's I, he's going to put it down and pick up a swim jig and go in and clean up behind me. So we can use our, our strengths and our weaknesses in, in unison together to where like 
we had a day last year we were just messing around and i was trying to learn to swim jig and he caught 40 fish and i caught like eight all day but where i, I lack he picks up and vice versa there's days where we both have really good days but we did it completely opposite of each other now do you go the old school way of like guy in the back guy in the front or are you guys both in the front we're shoulder to shoulder shoulder to shoulder yeah <laughs> yeah i still don't understand people that fish that way where you have a guy in the back it's like he's your partner you put him like, at a disadvantage yeah, yeah and it's weird because you're hurting yourself yeah. that's I've, I've never understood that at a all a lot of people want to be the hero right yeah they, they want to yeah have all the glory to themselves like oh yeah you know i cracked him yesterday but matt he didn't, he didn't catch anything <laughs> yeah and then it also depends on where you go if you go to lower potomac it doesn't matter if you're in the back yeah. of the front of the boat i mean you're fishing a giant grass flat but like we go to raise town and fish together yeah i mean it's shoulder to shoulder flipping jigs or senkos or whatever whatever you know, just... i mean even if we're fishing like flats at raise town to where i don't know if the dnr has sprayed that lake or what but the grass is not there like it used no. to be which is we're seeing it in Florida now. Mm -hmm. A lot of the guys that are pre-fishing for the uh, the Okeechobee tournament and stuff, there's no grass in Florida. Why the DNR spraying this stuff across the country is beyond me. It's irresponsible to the point to where they're they're killing these fisheries for for pleasure uh, boaters. Yeah, for a conservation standpoint of what the DNR is supposed to be, because in some states they're labeled the conservation police. Why are we not conserving our fisheries? Why are we hurting these things to the point where it's almost beyond repair at this point, especially Florida. Cause the guys down there right now, there's no hydrilla, there's no coontail, there's no milk, there's nothing. It's alligator grass or whatever, or straw grass, saw straw grass. grass. Yeah. That's it. Cause yeah, I think like, so when I had Matt on, um, Halleck or everyone, like one issue is like the wake boats, but you can't do anything about it cause the money involved in the homeowners. And like, I think this is where hunting almost has a leg up that the only people that go out in the woods or like Instagram people that want to take pictures and hunters. That's it. Fishing is weird. Where you'll have people buy a $3 million house for two days, but they have so much freaking pull on how that body of water is like set up and everything. And it's wrong. It is wrong because they're getting that lump sum of money once. You know, they're, they're going out for one weekend. So how much do they really invest into the industry? To whereas you have diehards like all three of us that are out there religiously dumping money into local businesses. Let's be honest. Like I have a Food by Fire shirt on right now. He's a buddy of mine, local company. <laughs> am I going to go buy barbecue at Famous Dave's and, and give some chain restaurant a bunch of money, or am I going to dump it in the local industry? Same way with Jake's. If I can buy it here, I don't care that it's more expensive because I know Jenny and uh, uh, Jared. You know, It's going to the, the families here. It's, it's keeping their lights on. This is their livelihood. So the, the fishing industry and shopping local, like if you go to Lake Anna, you have Sturgeon Creek, High Point, Anna Point, all three are tackle shops. If I'm at the lake and I need something, I'm not going to drive to Asheville and go to Bass Pro. I'm going to buy it there because I'm keeping that money local. So what the DNR is lacking on is is realizing that, you know, bass fishermen in particular, because we're all freaking tackle nerds, this box is, good Lord, a mortgage payment. And we have 30 of these boxes because we love it. And it's just like, it. once it takes over your life and you're consumed by it, it's like, it's it's all you think about. And we're really stimulating these local economies with with dumping this money into it are the pleasure boaters yeah sure they buy gas but that's it or they you know they buy wakeboards or something but chances are you know they're buying it on amazon or they're buying it at bass pro um bass fishermen and and fishermen in general because you can say the same thing about crappie fishermen uh trout fishermen i mean any any of it would rather go to a mom and pop shop and spend their money and help these local businesses rather than going to the Bass Pros or going to the Cabela's mm -hmm. and we get nothing in return, which kills me. I, I don't understand the reasoning behind it because we spend however much money a year, X amount of dollars traveling to these places. So even like when I go, we have a two day on Anna this year. When I go to Anna, if I need something, I'll go to High Point. I'll go to Anna Point. I'll get it there. I don't understand why we don't get anything in return. It seems like, well, we get one supplemental stocking on the upper Potomac of 4,000 smallmouth. And we don't even place these fit. We just dump them off a boat ramp and, hey, good luck, guys. You know, hope the muskies don't eat you. So I don't understand the DNR's logic and reasoning behind killing these fisheries and then not replenishing them in the long run. Because we're the ones keeping everything afloat. 
Like, yeah, and that's the and that's I think the the big issue there is they don't have enough funding and they don't have enough manpower to do everything, and they have constituents. And the problem is one of the big constituents are the lakes and and those like like ownership. So example is like you know we had um, we had the river keepers on for Shenandoah. I think yeah, this episode would probably have already dropped by now. Sorry, um, but yeah, he talked about like now Lake Anna is getting like a couple million dollars to investigate the algae bloom there. That's been it's been killing the Shenandoah for years, but Lake Anna's got it now because you know, the rich people don't like the algae. So guess what? Somehow they cut through the red tape real quick and got that money. And it's because that's such a strong constituent base. And I think what hurts fishing is the tribalism, 100%. And you guys, I, I, I've said this ad nauseum, the whole flathead comments and stuff like that. Like when you have the trout and the musky guys, the flathead guys, the smallmouth guys, the crappie guys all fighting each other, if we would all unite just to like, we got to fix the waterway, I think that would make the voice loud enough. Because like the NRA, Trout Unlimited, um, Ducks Unlimited, these are like good national organizations that are pretty lockstep and can get stuff done. But even like bass, bass is supposed to stand for like conservation. Bullshit. They're not. Like, hey, no. Like they're, they're not restocking That lakes. has turned into the most elitist organization in existence right now. Uh, I actually wrote it down as a talking point. Bass has really dropped the ball in my opinion on this whole you got to fish all nine opens to qualify for the elites if you win one you still qualify for the classic but that doesn't guarantee you a berth on the elites unless you maybe win but i still don't even think that guarantees you a spot um it has turned into if you don't have 10 weeks of vacation a year and a quarter million dollars to blow through the, the working man is out of it at this point they are. And there needs to be, and this is something I've been saying for Agnosium, they need to have another tournament trail that's a bridge gap. First and foremost, they need a bridge gap trail. Because it's like, if you go from college, you're fishing against, if you're in high school, you only fish against high schoolers, college, you fish against college kids. After that, you're fishing against like professional major league NFL players. Mm -hmm. Like there's no, there's no minor league system where it's just for them. And we used to have it. Where we did used you to have it. You know who does well with that? And I hate to say it because I really don't like Boyd Duckett. Sorry, Boyd, but you rubbed me wrong like 10 years ago, so... You know, maybe we can make up for it one day. But MLF does really good at that with the uh, BFLs. Since they've absorbed FLW, there's still that gap to be bridged there. So you can make your way up to Major League Fishing by starting at the BFL level and winning. Because if you win one of those, you get a new boat. But this is my issue with it. Brandon Polinick should not be allowed to fish a BFL. You know, Matt Lee should not be allowed to fish BFL because if you get second place and you would have won, mm -hmm. be, but Matt, you know, Lee decided to like to cherry pick that one. Guess what? It benefits you more to have that win for your sponsors and growing your brand than it does Lee. And the check. And the check. It comes with and, it because there's a drastic drop off from first yeah. to second place. It's either a hundred grand or 40 grand. And, and again, like this is the only industry that's is. You don't see Tom Brady going back and playing in college just to rip some kids. And then the coach is like, well, you know, if you want to, if you want to play, you got to play against the best. No bullshit. Like, it's just like you're at a different level, but the other thing is you're getting paid to be there. These guys are not, they need that check. And I think if you truly made a BFL series like that or, or a Costa series where it's like that, where you have to be, you're not professional, that would help you groom talent more because all of a sudden, you know, when you win, you're the best of your peers and you're ready for that next step up. But that way, when you're ready for that next step up, financially, you're there too because you've won all those tournaments and collected those purses. Um, and that's the first thing I think it needs to be changed. Bass-wise, when it comes to professional stuff, I truly don't know because with this recession we're going to go into, it's going to ca call a lot of We'll be early out. 2000s all over again. Oh, yeah. like, a lot of those guys will drop out. We'll go from an 80 angler field to like 60 maybe because some of those like teeter the guys that are on that borderline of are we getting cut or not that are finishing 60 to 80 every week like they're not going to be around you can't survive on that no, they're not. as much as i can't stand randy block it he's got a really good point when it comes to that like if you're on that cut line and you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to do this you can't survive you can't sustain you can't pay your mortgage you can't keep the lights on well and again it comes down to like it's on a sport like, again, I say the reason it's not a sport is like a, a true sport is where your athletic prowess, you can pay the bills with your athletic prowess. The NFL, you know, even golf, baseball, you don't get a $100,000 bill if you want to play in the professionals. They sign you and you make money with it. Mm -hmm. Fishing now, it's just if I give you a credit card with like an unlimited amount, you will eventually be a pro angler if you throw enough money at it. Like. Does that make it a real sport or NASCAR? Well, look at Milliken and all the money he makes from his YouTube channel that he's funneling into these tournaments that he's crushing it. Uh, well, he's a great angler, and but he, he's but, got unlimited resources. But he's doing it also, I think, the way you need to do it now, honestly. He learned, and a lot of couple guys are learning, and this is what also going down to ICAST, a lot of the old guard bitches about, is they realize you have to grow your social media first and then tournament fish. You can't tournament fish and then do the YouTube thing. Mm -hmm. Scott Martin is like a prime example of that. Yeah. He doesn't need to do bass anymore, and he'll no. be fine. 
And what Milliken did is almost, I think, whether you agree with it or not, that's what you need to do to be successful. Grow a brand big enough that if you win a couple of tournaments, great. Mm-hmm. But you're not going to be like, oh, I'm not eating today. Yeah, Rob Turk was the same way. He Turkless. went out and stunk it up. He finished like dead last in most of the tournaments he fished. But he had the financial resources to do I mean, so. Look at Randy Bach what he's doing. The reason he's jacked up his YouTube now is because he's with, um, oh God, not, not the Bass Tank. Whatever that guy is that does um, bass fishing stuff on electronics. The name will come to me. It's just like mine, but like he Bass Fishing HQ, maybe? No, it's something out of uh, the Tulsa, Oklahoma area. Okay. Um, to guys, I'll, I'll, anyway. But anyway, like he jacked up his YouTube channel because he realized, like, I need the social media presence. Mm-hmm. I need to do this because it's not about fishing, it's about marketing. And that's the thing that sucks, too, is I mean, you have to be marketable, which is great. You know, any business, if, if you're the, the face of it, you have to be marketable. Like, for what I do, if I wasn't comfortable public speaking mm-hmm. or if i'm not comfortable with or making you know whoever's in my class comfortable i'm not going to be successful at it so being marketable is great but along with that comes the the stress and the obligation to social media which i hate because it gets you in a rabbit hole and you're like all right well what are they doing different than i am why am i not successful at this and it kind of starts playing on that mental game where you're like all right now nah, i only got 200 followers why does he have 20,000 followers like how do i get to his level and then how do I do that without killing my, I guess, my, my psyche, for lack of a better term, of, you know, not dwelling on it, not being depressed that I'm not growing as fast as I want to grow. And it, it just kind of sucks because social media is a cancer, if I'm being honest. It is. It, 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 it's a thing that, you know, became very popular that... If you're keeping up with the Joneses, you're one step behind the curb already because that is eventually going to kill your frigging positive mindset to the point where you don't even want to do it anymore. You don't you want to stop fishing because, you know, maybe you're out catching nice fish always and you're not growing like you want to. Meanwhile, there's people that freaking catch a 12 inch fish and oh my God, they got 100,000 likes like following the analytics behind it it just kills everything uh the the best thing to do i i would say if you're trying to grow a page is once you post something don't look at that post ever again once it's published that's it don't look at the likes don't look at the comments especially the comments i'm sure you can it's, allude it's, to that it's fun <laughs> yeah just post it and forget about it if it blows up it blows up i mean you can download the analytics apps to where you can track to see what your page is doing sure fine good but don't look at what people are saying because eventually it's just going to make you depressed to the point where you're like, all right, you know what? Maybe I do suck. I don't want to do this anymore. And that's kind of what happened to me last year was it stopped being tournament fishing. It started being a nine to five. And I know a lot of people kind of get in that, that I guess, funk to where like, it's just not fun anymore. And you said it before the podcast, as soon as it stops being fun, it's, it's not worth it. So to, keep a positive mindset i think the big thing like we just talked like i know i listen to rogan every now and then and he's a big proponent of posting and forget about Mm it it just it helps you in the long run because you're not dwelling on well one person you know user 12 6 59 said i suck and now i'm like oh crap i suck i guess because we don't dwell on the positive we dwell on the negative so it's it's just fickle. This whole industry right now is fickle. It's really fickle, and, and you hit on something that's important, and, I, and I'm seeing this a lot now that I'm becoming more engrossed in YouTube, is you can either want to win tournaments or you can have a career in fishing, and you got to pick because they're not the same. You know, if you want to have a career in it, there's it, it's not a sport where it's just about how many rings you win. That's every other sport. I think that's the issue with a lot of people that get in this that played high school football, high school baseball or something. They think it's like, well, it's just about tournament wins and that's that's all that matters. You can have a ton of wins and there's a ton of sticks that you'll never know about and they won't be proficient. Or you got guys that don't win. Like Blockett is a perfect example. The man hasn't won a tournament since like nineteen ninety. But Yet he's had a career at this. He had a career because he figured out how to play the game. Yes. And that's the thing is like, I think a lot of kids coming up, it's like, you got to learn how to play the game right. If you, if you want a career, if you don't, no problem. You can mm-hmm. go out there, fish your local stuff and you could be a great local stick. Yeah. There's no problem. But if you want to make it a career, that's, it's completely different. And it's weird because again, any other sport out there, you just play the game and you're, you just go out there, win and you're going to be okay. But this is, it's just, it is different. And you have to learn. Again, you have to learn the social media thing. You have to learn how to talk to sponsors and to market your brand. And Well, look at Brian New. Brian New, yeah. That dude, he made it without social media because he was a good angler. He still doesn't have a strong social media presence, and you really don't hear much about him. Yet, he's consistent, top 30, week in and week out. 
But nobody talks about Brian New because he doesn't have a strong social media presence. Exactly. And he has a lot of family money. But on top of that, that helps. how many of those are out there compared to that? And that's that's the issue is especially with the elites now. It's for every Brian New, you have, you know, three or four like, you know, and again, Brandon Polnick wouldn't be a great example, but like three or four Scott Martins, mm-hmm. three or four John Cruises where mm-hmm. you just own a business and he's still a decent angler. But it, would he be able to make a living just angling? Probably not. The business definitely helps him with that. And, and again, I guess going down this whole rabbit too, whole with, with the uh, with social media and stuff is like, if you truly want to make a go at this, guys, it's a eight to ten year process, and you got to think about first about your fan base, your brand first, and then catching fish second. And I know that sounds weird, but you know, if you if you cr- stroke a twenty pound bag but you don't have footage of it, no one cares. Yeah, like, and it's almost like stand up comedy. I don't <laughs> yeah. know because I love stand up. Like it's probably one of my favorite things. And these these good stand up comedians like Tom Segura and Shane Gillis and uh, Mark Norman, these guys like protect our parks. Yeah, yeah, the best podcast <laughs> yeah. ever. You know, let's chug thirty Bud Lights and talk about and stuff. doing Molly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but these guys have put in the time to get there. They did, you know, their version of a local mm-hmm. tournament is a local comedy club for eight to ten years before they ever even got acknowledged by a Netflix special or a big headlining show. So they've put the time in to do that. It's the same way with bass fishing. Yeah, we can go out. Like, I'm sure if I would have filmed that tournament, it would have probably been a great YouTube video because I caught more fish than I ever have on the Upper Potomac, and I just didn't film it. Why I don't do that, I have no idea. I Why could, don't you do that? I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> I got four GoPros worth of jig sitting here, but I don't have a GoPro. Like, dude, I mean, you just do like a tackle porn segment or something like that. Like, Yeah, anything. Yeah. Any, and anything would help, but... It's, it's the same thing. Like, you got to put that time in, like you said, eight to 10 years to, to build that brand to get to where you want to be before you even think about stepping foot in it. Because you got guys like, like Brendan Schaub, who came from money, who got handed, you know, this Netflix special, and it tanked because he didn't put the work in mm-hmm. to get where he wanted to go. Same way with bass fishing. Matt, what do you think about that? <laughs> I. Because you're on the opposite end of the spectrum, to be honest. He yeah. doesn't have social media. He I don't doesn't... have any social media. I have zero. I don't have Facebook. I don't Do you have, have... a computer? I'm we a... live in West Virginia, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. I mean, I don't, I don't watch a ton of YouTube. I mean, you have I to just... get questions like that when you say, like, I, I, I don't own any social media apps yeah, or anything. It's I, like, well, do you, are you Amish or something? Or like, what's going on? I'm just on kind there? of it's on like... the exact. It's, it's kind of funny that we're, you know, we fish tournaments and we fish so much together because we're so opposite. He's huge into, he loves social media. He loves the YouTube, all of that. I I don't do any of it. I have a, I'm really not even the best to ask about it because I just, Jeez. I just fish off the grid. That's it. Yeah. And I'm as off the grid as it gets. I mean, if there's local tournaments coming up, he's the one that has to send it to me because I don't know about them. I have no way to see it. Um, I like it that way. It, it feels more pure. I don't, I don't know how to explain that. Um, when I go fishing, I don't ever care about likes. I don't ever care what the next guy's doing. Um, I had a little while obsessed over watching the guys that would post their Potomac teams tournaments online and then seeing, oh, this is where they were. This is what they were throwing. And then after that, it kind of ruined a tournament season for me. I'm Why? chasing what other people are doing. Instead of going out and doing exactly what I know how to do or finding my own thing, I'm trying to, I'm trying to fish like the next guy. And mm-hmm. I've seen it so many times that it doesn't work. Um, you just have to go find your own style of fishing. That is interesting because a lot of people get bent out of shape when you go video local derbies. Yeah. Because you're quote unquote, you know, ruining a oh. place that a thousand people have yeah. like. Yeah, he's in Broad Creek flipping my freaking tree line. Yeah. Like, oh my God. No one has known about this tree line yeah. for the last 300 years. Meanwhile, there's 150 boats fishing that same tree line in a video. Yeah. And yeah. then you get death threats. <laughs> and that's like, and, and so again, what I'm doing this year is I'm going to set up a GoPro, I think like Anna and time lapse for 12 hours. So you understand like that dock you thought was just yours. There's like 500 people that have hit yeah. that. Davey Height said it last year. He said, if you put a trail camera on the point that you, or that brush pile that you think is your brush pile mm-hmm. and a time lapse trail cam montage, you would be amazed at how many boats pull up on that brush pile. They said it would sicken you and you'd probably never want to fish that brush pile again. Well, it, it comes down to the psychology of it. I think it was t- two years ago when Jacob Wheeler won um, at Chautauqua. Uh, no, no, why, why I keep going Chautauqua? Um, but when, when when he was down there on, um, what the frick is the name of that? Like, God damn it. This is why we do pre-recordings. At, um, Chickamauga. <laughs> there there we go. He won that. It was when they had that like it MLF. Su- year. Yeah, it was yeah. the MLF like super tournament. It was like mm-hmm. $180,000 or whatever. And there was like 400 and boats. And he, he went and he had to have like a camouflage boat 
he wore he wore paint and stuff so you couldn't recognize his face. He had like a thousand waypoints and he talked his strategy like it was like it was like a rain man or something. It's like, well, if I go here, depending on how many boats are here, the fish are going to move here on this point. And then if I use these waypoints today, I'm not going to use them tomorrow. And it's like he understands that whole game of like if you go to a spot, you have a high you have a high percentage chance, especially if it's a Saturday or whatever, that somebody's going to see you. Do you understand fish behavior enough to know like where would they move and then what's your next thing? And I think it hurts a lot of anglers when you're like, well, no, I just have this one dock. And if this dock doesn't work, I'm screwed. And maybe it's a tidal thing because tidal does fish a little different than a lake. Yeah, because they're still... always moving. Yeah. Uh, there's an in fisherman study. They tagged the large mouth. They tagged a the small mouth. And that is a big dependency thing, too. Yep. The small mouth big. moved like one and a half miles in 24 hours. The large mouth moved from one tree to another, like yeah. 10 feet away. So if you're fishing a lake like that and you have that one spot, you go and catch 25 pounds off of it. Can you come back and do it tomorrow? Probably not. Oh, probably not. So, Especially a TVA lake or something like that with current. Yeah, and that's a, a big thing where, you know, a good talking point is before you even get to a tournament, map work and just sitting behind a map and looking yep. like the Deep Creek tournament. Never fish, I've never even seen that lake before in my life. But I studied a map for probably two months leading up of, all right, well, here's drains. Here's points. Here's a hump out in the middle of a creek that's just by itself. Um, all the contour lines, the depth of water I wanted to fish. Continuously track the water temperature because we can go off of history to an extent of, all right, well, if the water temperature is in the low 50s, this is where they should be setting. I'll go check that out first. So the map work leading up to these tournaments to me is more crucial than actually pre-fishing. I think, to, it, it, yes, I will say caveat, guys, because if you know me and my brother, because that that's a fun nightmare when you have your brother as your co-angler. I think, depending on the lakes and the time of year, I think you, you can overstudy, too. We got yes. effed because we overstudied for a spring tournament, and then it's like, great. When we got there, it warmed up by 10 degrees, and then our spots were shot. But, yeah, I agree, though. Like Depending on the time of year, it makes a break show, well, that's 100%. Another, like, with the map work, is like, all right, well, you know, in springtime, water fluctuates like crazy. Yeah, they don't said, stop moving. Yeah, the they don't, yes, yes they, they don't, don't stop store. moving. So having that spot within a spot, or having, all yes. right, well, if they're not on main lake points because it warmed up 10 degrees, mm -hmm. well, where's a main lake point beside a shallow bay that they'll pull up into? Is there still cover in that shallow bay? Because most maps nowadays are good enough to where they have shallow structure marked. Like the maps behind us, you can pull that off and find fish structures on Anna that have been placed there. So do I have a brush pile that's near deep water and shallow water at the same time? Is it near a creek channel? Is it a secondary point? Is it a main lake point? And I can have all this in my head and then I could refine it and I can go back and be like, all right, well, this is a more high percentage area because it's not just a point or it's not just a shallow bank. Uh, this has vegetation on it. This doesn't. So the more pieces you can put together, going back to the Jacob Wheeler thing, he knows fish behavior and how they work and how they operate and how they think so if you can see something on a map so can everyone else but if you get out there and you only have one day to pre-fish you can start there all right there's fish on it cool i'll start here in the morning or there's no fish on this fish structure that's on this map because there's 20 boats sitting on it are they in this creek channel now because the pressure has backed them off did they move up shallower because the water got warmer it's finding uh, the highest percentage area possible with his I guess as many different things in that area before I get there. So like I got the two day in Anna. I already have, I just got new Garmin units. Great with them. They have the active captain app. I can go ahead and mark waypoints. So when I pull up to the lake, I can be like, all right, well, I saw this on the map. This is where I want to go first. All right. There's a Creek channel off a point that has a shallow bay behind it with docks. And I know that that's where I'm going to start because that is the highest percentage area I have to catch a fish. And I do that for every lake. I'm on. Like, I had a really good day at Raystown. I haven't been there in over 12 years. I think we spent, what, the week beforehand? No, we went afterwards. No, I'm talking the week beforehand. Oh, yeah. Your just... I mean, it was every single night. Hey, these are areas we've done good. Sorry. But these are areas we've done well in. This is... It, yeah. We don't know Raystown. But it's nice that anytime you go into a cove, we have somewhat of an idea of what is there. And it comes down to patterning a lot, too. Like, hey, if I caught them on wood in this cove, I know I can go to this cove, and it's the same type of laydowns. It's, you know, it, it helps a lot with the patterns. Do you believe in the law of diminishing returns when it comes to this stuff? So, like, I, I, I look at, like, a McCluskey who's literally won every tournament on Fountainhead for the last 30 years, basically. <laughs> at some point, do you Shut really... Up, man. Yeah, like, like <laughs> do, do, do you really fish... Why would you fish that lake anymore if you're fishing a tournament series? Like I feel like when when I was dialed into the tidal Potomac because he loves it. Well, yeah, he loves it. But I mean, let's say if you want to fish a huge tournament circuit, at that point, I would say I'm going to go spend more time on Lake Anna. I'm not going to go fun fish the Potomac anymore because it's like I, I'm either going to catch him or I'm not at this point. But 
if you're an athlete and you want to round out your game. So let's say you guys spend a couple years on, on the title. At some point, we'd be like, listen, probably should go somewhere else and practice now because it's like, that's, this is all we do. That's where I come in. Yeah. <laughs> he has to. Because <laughs> I cannot convince him to fish deep water. No. So he figures so, out okay, the title. There we go. Okay. Yeah. And then I go out and I fish everything else. So that's our yin and yang right yeah. there is I'm comfortable fishing stuff that I like this year. I want a deep crank. It's one thing that nobody is popular is KVD made deep cranking in the early 2000s. How many boats do you see throwing a freaking DT20 ever? Nobody. Because it's the most, it's the most uncomfortable thing for people to do though. I agree. I agree. So what do people like to do? Fish their, their, their comfort zone. They don't like to step outside that because they don't know if it's going to work or not. Same way with throwing big swim baits. Like, will I get bit throwing a six inch swim bait? Sure. But if I bump up to a 12, I'll get the bites that I'm looking for. I might not get as many of them and I might go hours between bites because it's an uncomfortable thing for me to do. But you got to have it in your head the, where you need to learn these things. Like it's, it's, it's the same as even go to the shallow parts of the Shenandoah or the Potomac. There's a lot of people that do not feel comfortable fishing as fast as myself and Chris will. Yeah. And it's, it's so basic. I'm selling the same baits. I'm still throwing the big O or the brat or a DT six, but it is unreal how fast it is. A rearrange. I mean, you feel like your arm's going to fall off because it's just getting ripped that hard. Good t- uh, tennis elbow at the end of every night, man. Go yeah. And it's just stepping out of that comfort zone makes a huge difference because you can either speed way up or slow way down. Yeah. Everybody fishes that middle zone. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think the hardest thing is learning when to make the audible. I really, we fish like coked out rabbits in college where we would just, you know, if there's only five fish at a jerk bait, we're going to find them. But then you realize, and what hurt us is like, there were times where we just fished over the shit and it's like, when do you learn like, okay, I could blast through here, but I got, I'm sitting on 25 pounds in this area. I need to stop that to me. I have not unlocked that. Like, have you guys like, have you guys have thoughts about that too, about when to do what? I mean, to an extent, me and him do the same thing. Like, you know, title, you got to chase the tide. You got to run and run and run. He's really good at that. He knows what spot's going to turn on whenever it's going to turn on. And he'll run that rabbit all day long and he'll hit these spots and he's consistent. I've never really seen you come in unless you completely blank less than like 14 to 18 pounds in that range, which in a three-day tournament on the Potomac is cashing you a check any given week. 14 to 18 pounds, you're a top 10. Because a lot of people go down there and they'll they'll have a really good day on one spot and then they'll try to hit it again and again and again and the tide's different every day and they'll blank they'll have twenty five pounds the first day and blank the next one. Um, I figured out was it three years ago when I sent Quantico all day. Mm-hmm. I never moved. I moved like three hundred yards all day because I knew they were there. I want you. Okay, this is we're gonna have a debate here between you two because this is a fantastic argument because you have the diehards like you that I can always like you got to always milk run that shit. Mm-hmm. Then you have other people that say like I'm just gonna camp here and win, and both will literally work. Like mm-hmm. it's not like one's like 100 percent better than the other. So like I want to hear like your arguments for for like the milk run. I've done it, and it's not even just the lower Potomac; it's the Susquehanna as well. It's everywhere I fish. I think there's always a group of active fish. Tidal water, I think, opens it up even more if you know enough spots like it's i know 30 spots i can go run you obviously you can only pick one at a time but i think i can go in and fish a spot and there's a lot of times i roll up to a spot for 10 to 15 minutes and i'm on to the next it just, i keep just looking for active fish i don't see a point in spending if i can spend all day catching fish i don't see a point in sitting in quantico for eight hours or seven hours and just trying to drag a worm at them or trying to force force them to eat a chatter bait if they're not active they're not active yeah you fish the title plenty of times it's when they're not eating they're not eating at that point you're just waiting on them i think i can just run back to that spot whenever a tide changes Mm -hmm. and then catch those fish i don't have to have that dead period in between but going back to that what you said you're sitting on 25 pounds and you know they're there yeah and that's yeah so how do i weed them out so now i would consider myself a power fisherman i love to power fish what can I do differently to activate these fish that have seemed to, within the hour, go lockjaw? So the day that, specifically in Quantico, we caught probably 45, 50 bass that day. We had 18 and a half pounds, fourth place in the whole tournament, and we moved 300 yards. But we went and flurries, so we would catch 10 at a time in like 20 minutes and then not have a bite for like the next 30 I don't know if it's the fish moving and chasing the bait and we just so happened to stumble upon that school that just lit up at that time or if i tinkered enough to where i finally got back into you know where the fish are because you caught them on just about everything you own 
I caught him on swimming worms. I caught him on jackhammers. Uh, different. I threw a bee height delight and an all white one, a uh, green pumpkin. My buddy threw black and blue all day and crushed them. I caught him on Senkos. We caught him flipping. We caught him doing everything. But when that school fired, we were catching them on moving baits. When it stopped firing, I would go in and I'd start flipping docks or I'd start flipping the pad stems and just kind of refining. And that's where like a, a difference in bait selection kind of comes in. So you don't really, I know this drives you nuts. You don't need a thousand colors. Tom, I'm telling you. Black, you really green do, pumpkin <laughs> and white <laughs> will catch you fish anywhere. Just, you know, it, and kind of like looping all this together, if you're you know a new guy trying to get into tournament, the, the tackle world is intimidating. There's a lot of stuff out. But the difference, like the small differences, so I could take a jackhammer, the thumps like crazy, and catch fish. All right, well, they stop biting. I still want a power fish. So I go to something like a stealth blade, a little less thump, a little more subtle. Okay, maybe I catch a couple more on that and they stop biting it. And then I could pick up the same color in a swim jig, like this Beast Coast uh, Working Man swim jig, like a little finesse style. And I, I don't really have to change, you know, I can still throw a crawl trailer on all of them, but they all do something different. Because once you key in on a color, especially, you know, I kind of, I break it down to shad patterns, some kind of black and blue or all black and a green pumpkin. Because I can take those three colors and go anywhere in this country and catch fish and catch them consistently and catch big ones. Trailer selection to me is the, the bigger thing when it comes to this in these spots. Um... Like we just said, you know, we were cracking them on, on chatterbaits. All right, well, they stopped biting, so I pick a swimming worm up. Still got a thump. I can still power fish, but it's different. But I can change my color of my bait just based on a trailer. So if I want a beehive to light color, I'll just pick up a uh, green pumpkin and chartreuse Zayco and put on the back of it. Now I got my chartreuse. All right, they stopped biting that. Now I can pick up a baby bass colored Zayco. So now I have a more shad pattern with the green pumpkin and the white. All right, well, they stopped biting that. Let me go to a crawl trailer with orange in it. Now I got my perch patterns. So you just kind of tinker around and throughout the day, don't be afraid to change. I know like I even get in the habit of it, of whatever's tied on when I get there, that's what I throw all day. I won't stop to take that second to change that trailer out until it gets too torn up. And I'm like, all right, well, I have a half hour left. There's a random bait laying on the, on the deck. That's a different color than what I was throwing. I tie it on and I start catching them. <laughs> I like that. Now, Matt, do you, are you tinkering or are you just going to throw like three worms all day? I can tell it? you right now, I show up to the lower Potomac with one three quarter ounce jig. Oh my God. A swim jig and three chatter beats. And I will not throw anything else. Oh, you're not saying me. I don't pick up a frog every once in a while, but it's. You hurt me. I can't yeah, do that. I, 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 I keep I, it locked in. And this is a, this is like, I think the root of fishing because I definitely, as I've gotten older, more, I think like the Japanese anglers, I really appreciate their style of, of they're not going to run all around the lake because it's like, this is all we have. You just figure them out. And I think it comes down to like, do you figure the fish out or do you run? Because if all you're going to throw is a chatterbait, hypothetically, you could find five fish that bite it. But if 85% of the fish that day are not on a chatterbait bite, you could find the remaining ones, but they might not be the right ones. So maybe making that adjustment's the deal. And I, I don't know, like there's no right answer to it, but it's like, when do you leave versus like, I, and like, again, so guys like, you know, at this time, like the Hidden Gems episode just dropped, you know, Travis said like, there's, you know, there's a fantastic smallmouth bite and the bite wasn't on. So I said, like, let's go back to that first hole, tied on a spy bait and just smoked them. And it's like, we could have kept running around chasing the jerk bait bite, but they weren't on the jerk bait bite. We caught a couple and he ended up catching a really nice one with that, but it wasn't the primary thing. So in that moment, sticking with that first, you know, philosophy wouldn't have been good. Switching to the, they're here, figure them out works. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Brandon Polinick and some of those like really good anglers can do. They know which one to hit. And I just, I don't know how you refine that skill set of knowing like we milk run versus like, no, there's 30 pounds here. Like this is the area you can win. Well, it, that's where your style of fishing comes into play. I think more they like, once you have a pattern and you know, they're there, how do I get these fish to bite? Mm -hmm. And that's when I'll start tinkering. Like, do they want a jig? Do tinkering. they want a drop shot? Like, what do they want? I know they're here. I just got to figure out what they're eating and what they want to eat. Like the big thing, like, especially that I've noticed, like the lower is full of bait. You have everything. You got stuff from the bay. You got shad, you got perch, bluegills, crappy. I mean, you name it, it's there. So what are, what is this particular school of fish eating? And that's why, like, his three chatterbaits that he ties on, one's a perch-related, one's a shad-related, and one is, you know, whatever else. Like, figuring out what they want. Because I could throw all three at that school and catch them on one color and not the others. I had that problem last year where I was crushing them on a spot remover. They stopped biting, so I pick up something else. They're not biting that. Pick up another color, they're not biting that. Pick up a fourth color, they're not, and I pick a spot remover back up, and now I'm back on them again. So... 
I think it's more or less like just figuring out what that school of fish wants to eat for me because you know we're limited we have smaller boats he's got a 18 foot tracker with a 90 horse and i got an 18 foot fisher with a 75 horse i'm limited in fuel capacity and i'm limited in how fast i can get to a spot so if i have the bird sanctuary that's up by the 495 bridge and i have the beach which is down by um uh, aquia i can't make that run in a day so i gotta really limit and go back to my map work and be like all right well these are my high percentage areas in in a place that i can run efficiently and make it back to weigh in on time and not beat myself to death so how do i make these fish bite in these areas i also feel like when you sit and this is so weird because again like in college we would do the 500 waypoints hit all the prime spots but what i learned is when you sit in a day it's almost like sitting in a deer stand where you get so acclimated to that area I can't explain it except like and I've had amazing tournaments at Belmont or, or Madame Blue. I sat there all day and then you look and you figure out after a couple hours how the boats are operating. You're like, that place hasn't been hit in two hours, you know, and you move over there. But if you just are there for 10 minutes and you leave, you don't get that. I don't feel like you get that same acclimation to a spot to mm -hmm. where you find that subtle stuff that day, like within the day. Like, yeah, you can go waypoint a rock or whatever, but you don't see those micro adjustments that those fish make. And that to me is what's so hard about what you do with the milk run is. It, it, I feel like it's more rolling the dice of like if you are on it's like a guy that swings for the fence dude you look sexy one night where you hit four oh, day, yeah. four dingers and it's amazing and all the girls love you the next night you You're strike out for five four. yeah well, exactly. I think it's also with the milk run I'm fine to sit in a place so I'm not actively catching bass after bass after bass but I do want to see our bluegill popping yeah am okay. I having white perch or yellow perch following my chatterbait or swim jig in if they're following at that point I know we have the bait I know we have the grass I know mm -hmm. everything's lined up Okay, then I might sit for 45 minutes to an hour, learn this area, find where these bass are really keyed in at. You can find it on the lower Potomac. You can have a mile of coontail. Well, there's a, size, a spot the size of this table of milfoil, and that's where they are. That's mm -hmm. where I will stop and key in. As long as I can see something that's active. It doesn't always have to be the bass are the most active, but there does have to be the right bait there. There are everything. I don't know. It's it's. I guess as a fisherman, you learn this place is active right now. Do you think it's time of year based too? Because I know like even on the Potomac, like in the spring and those early tournaments, I'm less inclined to just run and gun because, and again, this is with lakes too, because you, when you feel like you can get fish coming to you yeah. versus like, you know, summer, fall, winter time when everything's more established. I think so. I think, I think Especially he's more consistent in the springtime. I think, yeah, I think there's days I will hit a home run, but then like he said, the very next day I can go out there and almost blank because they've moved to where he, I, I think I see more consistency in his springtime fishing on the lower Potomac. And that's only... Like yeah, that, I guess the analytics of everything. Like uh, I don't know. I didn't really understand aquatic grasses, so I started reading about them. So you know, your milfoil starts to bloom first, and it's the most consistent all year long. And then your coontail comes at a warmer water temperature. So finding those, you know, because some grass holds bugs like milfoil and coontail because it's really you know bulbous. It's got a lot of places for it to hide, which attracts the bait, which attracts the big fish. So if I have a thousand acres of eelgrass and there's a tuff of milfoil on the middle. Mm -hmm. I want to find that, especially springtime, because we want that newly emergent grass first. So really understanding the temperature ranges that these grasses start to grow in can help you kind of dial in. It's almost like, like bass fishing is almost like a master's degree. Mm -hmm. You got to know so much about everything in that environment that is going to hold these fish. So especially on the lower, and I mean, even in places like Racetown that don't have as much grass as it used to, but if I can find that newly emergent grass, that's where I'm going to sit in the springtime because that's where the fish are going to hold. That's, you know, it's the newest, most oxygenated part of that, that ecosystem at that point because that grass brings more oxygen to the water. So the fish want to be there. Not only that, you know, you got the bait around the grass because it's a place for them to hide. They have food within that, that grass. So the big takeaway from the lower, any grass fisher, anything that has something similar to that is finding those spots to where, you know, Quantico was like a freaking Sahara desert of grass last year. But there was a couple spots out there that had some good coontail, that had some good milfoil, and that's where dudes were doing really, really well, but they found that. And it might only have been a spot big enough for one boat to fish on, and I'm not going to be the guy that encroaches on that. They found it, that's theirs, so let me go find something different. But just finding that newly emergent grass at that time of the year, especially in the spring, that you can just set on all day long. Yeah, and I... <sighs> 
I really feel like those, what you're talking about is that, that micro, like, you know, a pattern within a pattern versus the, I call like the prevailing, the prevailing pattern. So let's use Deep Creek as an example. So maybe it's going to be one on like a couple of patches of grass, but then you always have a fire dock bite there, tons of docks. So you could say like the winning pattern might be the grass, but the prevailing one, like you're going to, the average bet for an average mm -hmm. is the docks. And I think that's what hurts a lot of guys when you fish a place too much is you get so micro, you get so niched in. Like I know where there's three tufts of grass in the back ass of Potomac Creek. But there's only three strands but if i get there I, I get 30 pounds and then all of a sudden you drive there and then all of a sudden like there's six boats you're screwed because okay that that might have won in this very small window but that's not the prevailing thing where you know you can go there and just bat for average and i think people if you want to get into tournament fishing you need both you need to like hey listen i can go catch 15 pounds throwing docks all day and there's a ton of docks but then i also have this home run thing possibly too and you need to balance that out because if you get so dialed in those are the people that get butt hurt that you found my grass it's like dude it's three strands like yeah there's no way in hell you're going to have those three strands to you all year long yeah and if you put all your eggs in that basket yeah that's just that's poor that strategy. also sets you up for a pattern, though, because you know if you have newly emergent milfoil at one place, then wherever you found it before, it, yeah. you got to go check it out because the Potomac changes every year, but it could potentially be there. Mm -hmm. So if there is 10 boats on that first strand, you just run to the next one, which mm -hmm. his pattern comes into play. So it's more or less like dialing in what you need to look for and knowing where it's at. And that's why the locals are so hard to beat down there because they're there. They, they got 10,000 waypoints of just tufts of milfoil within Coontail that are, you know in the most obscure location that nobody would ever think to look. And it kind of, coming back to what I was saying about the map work earlier, you almost know where like the, the highest percentage of, of places to find this stuff is to start looking. And once you get time on the water down there, you know, all right, what well, was here last year? Maybe it's not in the exact same spot, but it'll be somewhere in that area. You can find it again. How important it is to be a local stick versus a well-rounded angler. So an example is let's say, I give, again, I'll give you that blank credit card. I'll give you both that. You could be like a great stick on the Potomac, or you can always bat for average anywhere the series takes you. So you fish a three-day, whether it's at Kerr, Champlain, places like that. You can drop all over the country, and you're well-rounded, and you'll survive. Or you're just extremely hyper good at one thing. And I've always debated this. when you all, If all you were going to do is just fish a local derby, let's say just the Potomac teams, and that's all you do you would at some point get really good at that. But does that diminish your skill set to when you think like, I'm going to go fish like the opens and you're like, well, fuck, this is not because you're not well-rounded anymore. And I feel like that's a weird thing that if you want to, if your dream is to fish the bass opens, I feel sometimes these local tournaments are a detriment because you just get so in your, in this echo chamber and you don't really experience Smith or Kerr mm -hmm. and you learn all these other ways to catch them. And it, I mean, it's a blessing and a curse. He can speak to this when, because he loves the Lord Potomac. He, that's all I, that's all I fish. I go there what once, twice, three times a month. It's, more. but it does, it, it hurts the rest of your fishing. I think like, uh, I too fish too fast. I do everything too fast now because I'm used to lower time at go, go, go. I can't, you know, I, we go to race town together or anything like that. It's normally him finding the pattern because I can't slow down and stop throwing a spinnerbait or a chatter. And then the next two like, hours of me convincing him to pick up something else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it does hurt. Um, I think if you do want to be a tournament fisher, if you do want to fisherman, if you do want to fish BFLs, anything like that, you cannot just go fish local derbies. It, it hurts you so much. Yeah. Like the guys that fish the rivers up here that are hammers on the Potomac and the Shenandoah, put them on the lower Potomac. What happens then? Mm -hmm. Oh, they blank and they complain all day because this place sucks. You like what you like. You can't knock somebody for being really good at one area. If that's what they like fishing, that's what they like fishing. But if you want to have success at, you know, look at our tournament schedule this year. We go to Anna in March, and then we go to Racetown beginning of April, Lower Potomac at the end of April. Those three places right there are drastically different. Racetown and Anna, yeah, kind of similar. Um, but they still have those subtle differences. Like a lot less docks on rays. A lot. Less. Well, there's no docks. It's the Army Corps engineers are not allowed to be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Anna, I mean, you have docks. It's a Highland reservoir because it's got all these arms and fingers and everything else. Where Racetown is basically it's the Juniata River dammed up. It's just one big winding. It just looks like a big blown out river. It's a lot deeper than Anna is. Because Anna, their max depth, what, down about like 360 to 80 feet, yeah. somewhere around there? Race down is 300 foot deep. And they got blue back, I think. Blue back, shad, gizzards, mm -hmm. like all the shad in Anna. And then Race Town, you have shad, perch, uh, El bluegill, crappy. Elawaf, whatever it's Elwa, called. Elwa. Elwa. Whatever. Elwa, yeah. Weird things. Yeah. <laughs> but so just coming back to the club thing, too. I mean, 
you, you make a good schedule like this and you get this experience of fishing all these different places and everything's a learning curve. Like I go to Anna and I'm, I got a pattern kind of already in my head of what I want to do. And I want to go check it out. I'm going on Friday tournament, Saturday, Sunday. So I'm going to spend a day pre-fishing, running a couple different things, see if I can get some bites and the quality of bites. And then when I go to race town, it's completely different. We're starting to get into that good pre-spawn phase to where last year set me up for this. Like I already know where I'm going to start first. And then we get to the lower Potomac and that's a whole different animal. And then from there we go to the Susquehanna, I think, which is completely different than all of it. So being well-rounded at all these places, eventually, if you want to be a tournament fisherman, you have to do that. Yeah, and I think that's what's so weird about the damn sport is like, it's, it's almost like you have to hit a home run to get into the league, but once you get there, you have to bat for average. And yeah. so it, it's weird that as you're going through, they promote you just being this guy that can just every now and then you're going to, you're going to win a tournament and you'll get in. But then you realize you can't have that mindset and actually survive. You have to bat for average. And so I almost challenge people. It's better to finish. Like you, if you go on the Potomac and you're a Potomac rat and you always finish in the top 20 there and you're fishing top 20 everywhere you go, that's better than if you're a guy that can like get first on the Potomac, but then you're gonna get a hundredth everywhere else. Like, and I think that's so interesting. Cause like, even when I grew up fishing the Potomac, I thought I was terrible at the Potomac and I was compared to the rats, but then we would have like regional college events and I have guys from Ohio calling me like, I don't know how to do any of this shit. And it made me realize like, I've been in such an echo chamber cause I've lived here mm -hmm. that I didn't realize like, there's a whole other part of the world that's like, like doesn't like, am I gonna die if I get on this river? Is it too dangerous? How does the tide work? And then you really realize when you face regional competitions, like, oh shit, you know, it's almost like, you know, you, you switch schools and you were in a highly athletic school and you go to like, you know, with a bunch of anorexic people and all of a sudden like you're the biggest kid on the block. You really realize that you're actually better than you think. And at what point do you stop chasing like all the locals and you realize like, OK, I'm good enough. I need to go to Lake Anna and figure this out. I need to learn live scope because we're going to have a small amount of tournament where I need to learn that. And I think that's what's something that you're experiencing now, which is so important. Yeah, it's a it's a blessing and a curse. You know, good on Garmin for, you know, setting the industry standard. I 100% agree with, like, anything else in life. Like, I teach firearms. Red dots on pistols is becoming a thing. What does that do? It eliminates your sight, picture, sight alignment. So now I just have one thing to focus on instead of three. So is technology a good thing? Yeah, in every industry. Like, you got better mics. I'm sure it helps your podcasting. Like, to totally write off a new technology is almost irresponsible. But with that comes the the you know the the other side of it. If you're not a good angler and you have a live scope, it's not going to help you because you still suck at fishing. Like you still you, don't know the core. Yeah, you, you don't know the core. You don't know the basics. Like where we started and what we've come up with from no electronics on a boat and just beating banks and you know learning the fundamentals and now going to this. Like that's why McCluskey has so much success. He's a good angler. You can put McCluskey anywhere and he's going to destroy. Like he's going to catch fish. But you give a good angler like that these tools, and it makes them better. Just because you have the tools doesn't make you a good angler. So I'm a, a proponent of technology and, and the industry moving forward to an extent because it is a good thing. It makes good anglers better, but it doesn't make a bad angler a good angler just because they have this technology. What is the so what is the cutoff? So I like assume I go back to the firearms. You wouldn't want to conceal carry a flintlock pistol anymore. Yeah, like we've come, we like, have semi auto. Yeah, you know, we, yeah we, we've come places. Yes. So like, what is your cutoff? Like, well, this is enough. This okay, is good so, enough. I mean, this is like to me the pinnacle of what fishing is technology wise could be. I don't know where we could go from from live scope. We're actively watching these fish on a screen move. I think that's what they've said since flashers came out though. You know yeah. what I mean? It oh, doesn't God, get better yeah. than this. Remember when uh <laughs> God was it? it was Hummingbird. It was not I think it was Kevin Van Dam and somebody else, whoever won that class, Alton Jones, and he had side scan for the first time. Oh yeah. And then they were like this come Where do we go? Oh yeah. Like it's it they were so pissed about that stuff. And then now look what we are with live scope, same conversations. But I mean you can see the fish on the screen all day long. You still have to get them to bite. And that's where become, or being a good angler and having this knowledge of all these different places and all these different, you know, because if I go out on a school of, of big smallmouth and I'm throwing a freaking seven inch curly tail rubber worm at them and I'm fishing above them, below them, because, you know, fish like to feed up. They don't have a tendency to feed down, especially when they're schooling, because, you know, to them, it's like an ambush thing. They're coming up to eat. So if I'm fishing below them, it's not going to do me any good. If I don't have a common understanding of how they feed and what bait to present them and what they're keyed in on, like, am I looking at a ball of shad on the screen? Am I looking at a school of crappies that these largemouth are feeding? What am I looking at? So without having that knowledge and that skill set, because you can't cast, you're not going to be able to get to the fish. 
if you're throwing the like i don't know it's 30 feet of visibility and you're throwing a 20 pound test with a one ounce jig because you want to get down there and you don't want to break it's not going to help you so refining your tactics and being a good angler is the key to all of this if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know how to present to these fish you can see them on a live scope all day long you're not going to catch them but the caveat to that is we have this stuff now it's open to recreational anglers coming back to what we talked about with the dnr earlier there was a guy in missouri that told another angler that every day he fishes this lake five days a week he's on this lake and he catches a limit of crappies every day he's on this lake him and his buddy both limit out 150 a day for five days a week because of live scope because they were good crappy anglers before that now they have live scopes so they can really key in on it and they can so why at this point in technology has the conservationist not stepped in and lowered limits because if a recreation, you know, there's people out there that keep everything they catch. Even if they don't eat it, they'll give it to somebody else that will. But why, why, why are we not being proactive in lowering limits instead of 75 crappy a day, maybe 20, maybe 15? Because if you got somebody that's catching whatever 150 times five a week is for 52 weeks out of the year, you can really decimate a population just out of one boat. Well, government's reactive. It's like, um, I forget what his first name is, like Hamlin for the Buffalo. And, and all of a sudden, they're going to be like, probably there's going to be new rules coming down about crap because it's like, let's react to this because mm-hmm. it happened instead of being like proactive. And any government agency will be like, again, with the, you know, with the Smith, Smith Mountain Lake accident, like, will there be new laws going on the books because of those two kids sadly lost their lives? It's like, again, it, it, it's, it's, it's being reactive versus proactive. And I think with the live scope, you're 100% right. I think the technology is getting so good to where it's like, <sighs> you're going to be able to call out more fish. And, and I think, I think it was, um, it was, uh, uh, fork, Lake fork adventures, Lake fork guy, Lake fork guy. He talked about this. Like the biggest issue you see with crappie fishing is you can start telling between what a female and a male is because of how they actually set up. And so you're seeing in some of these big crappie lakes, you can actually scope around and be like, well, that's a, that's a female because of how she's setting up and you catch that one. Mm-hmm. So you can hurt a population. If no, this all can your get, spawners are gone. Yeah. If you can get rid of your spot, if you can be that precise, there needs to be new regulations on the board. I 100% agree with that. 100%. I mean, it's just, it's not going to be until these lakes are dead that they actually do something about it, whether it be supplemental stockings or lower limits or whatever. But it's the government as a whole. If you get them involved with anything, they'll ruin it. It's They're reactive to everything. It doesn't matter what it is. Until something happens, like drunk driving, and when cars first came out, was probably legal. But we're not going to go ahead and take that initiative to, to, to stop that until something actually happens. Same way with, I mean, it's anything that they do. Anything they have a hand in, they're reactive to. You're 100% correct on I, that. I do think it would be neat to see a, a two separate leagues start forming where you have, like, the live scope crew and then you have the non. Like, your boat can be set up specifically. Like, you're not allowed to have mm-hmm. technology on it. I think that's where we're going to be going. Look at stock car racing. Yeah, exactly. You got different classes of different cars. I like, mean, you're literally just taking that design, mm-hmm. that, that model, and you're transporting it Same way over. with the, the shooting industry, like USPSA matches, you have open divisions to where you can have the freaking space blasters that have red dots and, you know, the slides cut so it's super light and you can get, you know, man, or recoil management out the, you know, it just literally looks like you're dry firing because the gun doesn't recoil. Or you have the stock class to where it's just a stock lock and you're going. So to for fishing to pick that up and have those different divisions would be a, a blessing. For a com- even if it's just the competition standpoint too, like again, like you see this in sometimes youth sports and baseball before they put in the bat regulations, where if you could fork out five hundred bucks for for a double wall hot stealth, your kid would literally hit the ball further. Yeah, you, you could buy some success. And now we have BB core, and, and, and yeah, kinda... and they deadened it, so everyone has yep. to have up to this thing. And again, so like guys, we're not trying to speak out of our mouths. Like yes, uh, live scope will make you a little bit better. It will make everyone a little bit better, but it'll make a good angler great. That's the difference there. A good angler understands the technology even better, but everyone can buy a little success with it. I don't know how much, but you'll buy some. It's like if you put power poles on your boat, I think if you're fishing the, like the tidal Potomac, it would make you a little bit better angler just because you have better boat control. So uh, eventually you'll catch one or two fish. I don't know how many. So with that said, when you have this like arms race of technology, and it's getting so expensive, like you did not have two graphs on the front of your boat until live scope really was a thing. Every now and then you might see one guy with like a 10 inch and maybe a little nine inch for GPS, but that was it. 
Now you have three on the front and you have two in the back. All the pros got five. It, Grass. You got it, it, 360 down imaging live scope on the front. And you got mapping and side scan on the back. And Brandon Polinick is now running six lithium batteries. <laughs> so he's probably going to have, we're going to have more batteries in a boat than a Tesla. I mean, I got soon. four in my boat. It, I have one per graph. I used to have only three. Yeah. And that was because I ran out of Two for a trolling motor, motor and one for a cranking yeah. battery. Yep. So now I have those three. Plus I have one per graph. So my nine inch has a battery and my front one has the new uh, Amped Outdoors 32 amp hour that's mm. specifically set up for a live scope. But like you just said, like I remember being a kid, maybe two batteries in a boat. Mm -hmm. 12 volt for the troll motor and 12 volt for the cranking battery. That's it. And you have to. like, If you want to be competitive, you have to learn this technology and, and push it. I think maybe you put limitations on how much you spend which again, I forget the year chat helped me out where it was like with the Bassmaster Classic, everyone had to run out of the same boat, same stuff. Yeah. The, the first initial yeah. Bassmaster Classic, they had, everybody had the same exact boat, the same exact graphs. They were allowed, what was Ten. it? 10 pounds of tackle? 10 pounds of tackle, something like that. Yeah, it was one tackle box. So you really had to refine That would be cool. Bring that. I would love to see that again. Back. Yeah, yeah. Let's... But yeah, because that, that's important. Because again, at some point it's like, is it the technology or is it the angler? But the problem is, like you said, is it the angler? Yes. But the more technology you put in there, the more it puts into question how much of it is the angler. And I kind of agree with that. But it's also from a marketing standpoint, the optics are just, it's shit. It is. You are spending more money than equine and golf, which are literally the, they sell Rolexes. That's the, that, what do you sell at those things? It's Rolexes. It's for the rich white man. Yeah. Fishing is now more expensive than the rich white man sport. Yeah. How can a kid get involved in this? How can anyone get involved in this? And, and that's where the, the, the class separation would come in. It's, all right. here's your stock class. You get a boat, you get down scan. Mm -hmm. All right. And here's your open division where you get whatever you want unlimited. It would help greatly because I mean, it's so hard. I mean, even, you know, I'm not the richest guy in the world, but I do okay. For me trying to keep up, I'm like, oh my God. Yeah, like I got to save for this whole next year to buy this new latest and greatest thing. And by the time I buy it, it's like, all right, we've already had two more things come out. Oh, well, I think that's why kayaking is taking off because it is. It's like what the most expensive pimped out kayak is just a down payment on a new Skeeter or Ranger or whatever. It's down payment. You're buying a trolling motor on one of those things. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's insane though because like I think the most pimped out one I saw online was like 10 grand. Yeah. And it had. It's like it had, top of the line. Yeah. Torquedo. It had like pan optics, everything. Like it was legit. But. Again, like I, I, I was, I was thinking to myself, like, why would you do this? And the, and the dude lived in Ashburn. Mm -hmm. He he lives in like one of those horrific. I hate Ashburn, by the way, everyone. I absolutely hate <laughs> Ashburn. But it's just one of these stereotypical houses. He's got like a little ass driveway, and he doesn't even have a garage. But he's like, I can have a pimped out thing. I can keep it there. I can throw it in my my SUV on top, and we're good to go. And that's when the light bulb went off. It's like you are now hitting a demographic that you can't with Skeeter. Yeah. So there goes the chance of me ever having a brand with him. But the point is, like, like with them, like, you're not going to spend a hundred thousand dollars on a boat, just a boat, a bare bones <laughs> boat and a motor, yes. nothing else, nothing else. I priced a Vexus the other day, the base model Vexus. So they're like top of the line, like 000. ninety-two grand. Oh, Jesus Christ. And then I haven't added a Garmin Go or what is it? The Garmin? Uh, is it the Ghost? No, it's the Lowrance. The Force. The Force. Yeah. Jeez, I haven't added grass. Like a power I Rangers added thing. Any, like, by the time I get a boat, like that guy that. Uh, yeah, his Ranger is like 140 grand. The way it's like everything he has into it, all lithium, Who? all new wiring in it. Who's this? Uh, his name's Richard. Really good. It's a guy I grew up, not grew okay, up fishing a, with. Okay, he's yeah. not a guy no, you no. saw on you Google or something. No, gotcha. no, he uh, his boat's ridiculous. I who's in love with to? it? <laughs> well, yeah, he uh, good on him. I mean, he's got everything. He always has the latest, greatest. The you know, the biggest troll emitter you can get. Live scope, side imaging, 360, everything. He's got. All of it. And it is beautiful to be in that boat. But I can tell you anytime I've ever fished with him, I've never turned a graph on. Um, oh, God. I mean, that's, well, I think that's also instance. where we get. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, you know, I think. How many times you have you the stomped most, that dude out in the yeah, tournament? I think you have the most pimped out little 18 foot. John boat ever, basically. Yeah. And mine doesn't even have a graph on it. You so. two need to get sponsored by, what was Keith O'Shea? Gator Tracks? Whatever oh, it is. Yeah. You need to get one of those things pimped out where you have like a winch on the front and you can just jump dams and crap. That's your brand. That's what you guys need to get. <laughs> yeah, until That'd people awesome. start putting little rock dams in front of your honey hole so you can't access well, That's why you just get a rock proof. Yeah, there you go. Dude, <laughs> no, I've never seen people look sound so stupid when you bitch about him for not running a big expensive boat. That makes you look so retarded when you say something like yeah, that. Yeah, why? I, I, like, I, why would you open your mouth and say that? And I love like Bradley Hallman and places like that where it's like, oh, well, it's not fair because we have to run a hundred thousand dollar boat. It's like, what the? You, you don't understand how to. you sound? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <You> elitist pricks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it just makes you sound elitist. And then something else that I learned, I think it was from Travis Luger, is like, 
at, at the elite level and the MLF level, you have to run a new boat every year. Yeah. So if you're just starting out, not only do you have to understand that you have to get a brand new boat, then you you can't just keep that for three or four years. You can't run you a, get a new boat. One, you well, have to do a new one get, every single year. Bassboatsforsale.com is a perfect example of every pro is dumping their boats right now. Brian Schmitz is on there right now. Mm-hmm. So you just bought this $150,000 bass boat that you're now selling for 69000 like it, the the depletion of value in these things. Oh, it's it terrible. Just, but yet, ten years from now, the boat's still sixty grand. Why? Mm-hmm. I, that's the one other thing I don't understand. Because like now, like boats from two thousand two, two thousand three are going for thirty, forty grand still. I I think so. I think part of that is if I had to like play guess, is I do think they don't make boats like they used to. Is true. I think fiberglass hauls way back when were just better than they are now. They were more durable. They're durable. Yeah. Because Vexus has a you know how they have the aluminum fiberglass hybrid. Yeah, get to that. So yeah. there's like a separation. Like the 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 fiberglass doesn't want to bond to that aluminum. So a lot of the hauls are cracking apart as people well, run them. The fiberglass I know. I know their aluminum is not great, but their fiberglass is supposed to be legit because it's like the original OG Ranger people because they uh, built my boat gotcha. and that's supposed to be damn near bulletproof. Yeah. So I know. I think there's like that, Russell's Ranger. Yeah. That 1999 to like 2005. Yeah. Like, the best boats ever made. But and then though I know those hold their value. But like the nitros. You remember back in the day in nitro, like you would not fish out of a nitro because you look at it and it starts cracking because yeah. it was made so and badly. Then around mid or what, two thousand eight to whatever when they went to that new hall design, now everybody wants them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's but again, so it's like I I don't know. Like I feel like there is it's gotta pop at some point. There's no way boats are gonna be like two hundred thousand dollars. Like at what why do point? I get on Express's website and look at an eighteen foot aluminum boat? And it's forty two thousand dollars. Why? And I need some. I need a rationale behind that. I think it's a Yamaha. Honestly, I think it has to be that. The the junk on the back. <laughs> yeah. Well, but yeah, because like that is weird. Mercury, like, or nothing else. Honestly, if you want to give it to me, I'll use it. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but I just can't figure out. Like, I mean, even the price of motors are they really that expensive? Because if I want to go out and you know get a crate motor for my truck, it's what like three or four thousand dollars. I, w- I was I was listening. I was down a YouTube rabbit hole about RVs way back when the pandemic hit, and this guy had this interesting thing to say. That he said that he sold. He's two generations of selling these things. He says every recession and inflation thing, the prices go up, but they never go back down because it yeah. gives you an excuse to put them up. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what's happening now. It's just this this bar keeps getting moved, but it will never go the other way. Well, and then we had the supply chain shortage where nobody yep. could get stuff, so you're just naming your price on whatever supplies you needed, like the lumber industry. My mm-hmm. God, a freaking two before was like forty fifty bucks. And you wonder if it's just fake value, if it's real or not. No, it doesn't hold any weight. Yeah, so it's like... You can blame the government for that, too. I don't know, probably. But, like, (laughs) if you look at it with the boats and stuff, if it does get that expensive, like, at some point, the bubble has to pop. And I've bitched about this with Major League Baseball. You can't have your shortstop making more money than the GDP of, like, Wakanda. That makes no sense at all. Like, at some point, a baseball player is not worth a billion dollars. I'm sorry. NFL's got that right. So, But when will it pop? Because it will pop. I think when it does, that's going to be a huge... That's the industry will crazy. crash. It'll be 2008 all over again. And, you know, it's the lowest, you know, sponsors are going to start pulling money from these anglers and they're not going to be given as much. And now we're going to have to start putting money out of our own pockets to buy the stuff. And then that's where the prices are going to start dropping. And the used market even now is it's insane of how much people ask for use boats or use graphs or used anything they want almost wholesale price for something that they've ran for three years four years ten years why am i paying you 900 bucks for a three-year-old garmin head unit that is pretty well obsolete at this point oh because you paid a thousand for it five years ago i don't understand why everybody thinks like the the stereotypical oh don't try to haggle i know what i got like a 99 Ford Ranger on Facebook Marketplace is 10 grand for some reason. You don't know what you got. Drop the price on that thing and get it sold. It's just. I feel like this is coming from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely is. We yeah. both really want new yeah. boats. We talk good about yeah. our, okay. our boat. I want a new boat. Bad. We both love new ones. Is, is, <laughs> is your boat still for sale, by the way? Do you want to pimp that out on the podcast? No, or? I mean, if, if somebody wants. I know what I got, all right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now nah, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to hang on to it. I've. Every tournament I've ever won's been out of that boat. So dream boat, then go. Dream boat, Jason Christie's boat, twenty-one foot express. Oh, they got to say he's in Skeeter now. No way. That just dropped on Monday. Yeah. Wow, win the classic and drop who brought or <laughs> who you brought with you. Dude, I am sorry. Like that's the thing that, that just 
I, I get it. It's a business thing. But when you guys chill out all the time, you're like, well, this is the best boat. Two years later, like, this is the best boat. It, is it really? Just, or are you just saying that because they gave you one? Yeah. I mean, like, it's if, not the best. If I'm, you're headed to Berkeley and it's like, you know what? This is the only crankbait ever made that works. It's like, are you sure that's the case? Oh, and then you get that fancy Mega Bass sponsorship. And you're like, man, the Sonic side is so much better than the Fritz side. And like, I, I think that hurt. Zaldane's brand more than anything else ever I've ever seen where you go from Mega Bass to then Guggen and 13 and, and then you cannot <laughs> you can't say you can't it's go best. from a four core steak dinner to like I'm sponsored by McDonald's guys yeah. now listen this burger is this just McDouble? as good well, I'm telling yeah, you blow Roos Chris out of the water <laughs> dude <laughs> like cause everyone ca- I've never seen a fan base catch shit like sniff it understood immediately what was going on more and, and then he would not come clean and be like guys they're paying me more and all you had to do is say like they're gonna pay my bills and everyone would have got it you well, don't have to go out there and chill out and be like no these guys are gonna they're make- not transparent at all they're not and that's where we've seen if you follow the bodybuilding or weight uh, weightlifting industry the transparency now with these guys that aren't sh- like they're obviously using these supplements that they're sponsored by, which is great. You this know, has been brought help. to you by Liver King, by the way. So. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Primal Nutrition. <laughs> but it's they said their own steroids. We all knew it. Mm. It wasn't the protein powder they were drinking. No, you're blasting trend, you know, seven times a week. Like we know you're on steroids. Just say it. And since they've come out and admitted, you know, the the use of other substances rather than supplement companies they were sponsored by nobody cares Aww. we still buy those supplements because we're like all right yeah it does work like there's you know facts to back this up like if you supplement protein like you're obviously going to get bigger you're going to gain weight because you're getting the proper protein intake because maybe you can't get it in your diet because the way the meat prices and stuff are it's expensive but if i buy a jug of protein i can still hit that macronutrients and still get bigger and it will work authenticity it just it, it's it, off it goes authenticity yeah and to to say that all right yeah i've ran a 21 foot express for three years and now i'm sitting on a 21 foot skeeter and this boat's the best yeah but your, your express was the best last year mm-hmm. so why not just say like all right yeah this boat is good this is what's good about it and leave it at that i don't need to hear that it's the best because it's not everything's objective just say what's good about it and shut up like that's all i need to know this is what's different and compare and contrast and i really think it, what happens with a lot of these people i think they lose their way of like they think who matters is their sponsors and not their fan base and it's weird because it's like i i feel like it, your fan base is what got you there like i get the sponsor thing but a lot of people lose that i think that's why tactical bass and has such a cult following is because the authenticity for better or worse mm-hmm. is and again guys so i will say i shill out i did get to meet and talk to them at icast so i am shilling a little bit here but the point is like they are who they are and they do buy everything and fish everything. And that comes across versus you do have people where it seems like they are more worried about what their sponsors think than their fans. Right. And I think that's important. Always remember where you came from and be loyal to your fan base. Cause if they're gone, the sponsors leave. That's the thing. Like yeah. the sponsors aren't going to stay if you piss off your whole fan base. Well, look at the, uh, the prime example, their last video. I mean, they got the river to see tactical DD crank. Mm-hmm. Talk about it in all their crankbait videos, but what else do they do? They bring out the mega bass deep six Yep. or the, what is it? The, the, Deep three, a deep three. They also did the rock crawler and the one rock crawler because so they, of the they depths. talk about all these things. Yeah. Even though they're like, yes, this is our crankbait, we designed it. This is ours, but here's five other options mm-hmm. that are just as good or better in certain situations. And that's my biggest draw to them. Like you just said, like transparency is key. And they don't shell out a lot. Like again, like how many DD video uh, tactical DDs do they do in a year? So like they might shell out one or two videos a year out of four they drop. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, you're allowed to. It's yeah. the guy that every video, it's like, this is the only bait you can throw. And that's why I, I, I that's why I spend so much money at Thanksgiving when they start dropping those, those videos. Cause you feel like, oh shit, like they have fished everything. And I kind of believe what they say. I, I try craft just because they tell me to. And I really think like, I don't know a lot of guys anymore that literally if, if Matt Allen says like, you should try this new swim base. Like, well, goddamn right I do. There's Bye. a reason it sold out on Taco Warehouse the next day, everything they talk about. I honestly was always big line everything. And then after this past year where I literally said, I'm going to learn BFS. Like I literally, that was my thing. I was going to learn BFS. I got two nice setups or three actually and then I didn't realize again like let me get one huh? let me get one no you're not gonna get one my setups. <laughs> I, I love them I got this uh, 18, 18 fishing or 18 outfielders like custom it's called uh, the suppressor ultralight 
Oh my God, that is so much fun. You throw like little trout jerk baits and you can just bomb cast them and just smoke them in ponds. But spy baiting, I like now more with that too, because I can just load up. Because again, like I, I don't mind tying knots for my, my, my setup, but it's kind of nice when you can just roll up six pound fluorocarbon and yeah. not have to worry about it. Like that's kind of That's the nice. only reason I want a BFS setup is not to fish soft plastics or anything else like in that BFS realm. I want it for those pointer 68s. Mm -hmm. I want it for the, the 0.5 crankbaits or at 1.0 at the max and just put eight pound fluoro on it and power fish on that BFS. Cause it, this rod would honestly probably be a really good BFS rod. It's a Phoenix K2, which is- grab it if you want. If you nah, want to it's show all it good. It's a, nah. It would be a great rod for that only because like, I, I want something with a lot of tip and a little backbone just to power fish on. Cause I haven't really bought into the whole BFS thing because everything I do, I could do on BFS, I can do on a spinner rod. So this is how I break it down. Except for power fishing. Is is the BFS, what's so nice about that is when you need control. So like if you're jerkbait fishing like the just the gut of the river, you don't need it. But if you're trying to jerkbait fish around trees and shit, it's awesome because you can stop it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be precise, I think that's where the BFS is nice. Because I, again, you cannot convince me. I can always outcast you with a spinning setup properly done than a bait caster. I don't care how much you throw into that reel because spinning is legitimately made for that. Surf fishermen do not use a bait caster. No, they use a spinning reel. Like, I, I don't understand that argument at all from, like, the Brian News and stuff. Like, you know, I can now just use a baitcaster. I just like the control that I have with a baitcaster over spinning gear. Only because I, I got three spinning rods. But I got, like, what, 17 or 18 casting combos. I <laughs> can just do so much more with a casting rod. I, I just feel that there's more tapers and more lengths and more, like, whereas your bait selection is super dialed, my rod selection is super dialed. So I can get... You know, I could have five, seven foot, three rods at all, do something different. Like, he texted me the other day and was like, man, I got all these seven foot, whatever, medium heavies. I was like, yeah, but they all do something different. I actually had more success now that I've switched to throwing shaky heads and Ned rigs on bait cast equipment than I ever did with spinning gear. I Am I it's... crazy? Because I feel like I get more bites and I don't know why. Like, I don't know if I just feel better or if I work it better. I think it's all a confidence thing. Because uh, I've actually went back to throwing shaky heads on that 7-7 uh, seven, seven spinner rod that we're I have. We're going completely different directions. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. We're just off the rails now. <laughs> this is freelance podcasting at its finest. Oh, my God. I, I actually have a talking point on this. If uh, Going back to what we talked about before with uh, getting into tournaments and stuff, you don't need you know 30 different combos. You don't need to keep up with the Joneses. I actually brought a rod selection today that would be a good starting point for anybody getting into tournaments uh like uh, a place that they could start when it comes to rods and techniques because let's hey, let's do that then let's okay. guys so what we're gonna do is uh, matt you want to grab some stuff off the shelf if you didn't bring any rods sure but when it comes to to rods and reels i mean in tackle and everything me and me and matt are like uh the magic man and el diablo shake and bake all day long like i i could go pick up his tackle and be universal with mine and vice versa like we have the same stuff but getting into the the selection for you know, just breaking down the first couple rods. Like if I was going to start from scratch, I'm brand new to tournament fishing. I'm brand new. I got like, a, it doesn't even have to be a big budget, but buying quality over quantity is the biggest thing because I can have these rods for years and years and years. They're all high modulus graphite. I'm going to have excellent, you know, return on investment out of these things. They're going to last. I want to get good use out of them. And I never have to worry about my gear being at fault. It's never going to be the gear's fault if I lose a fish or if I break. It's going to be my fault. And, and you said quantity over wait, quality? quality over quantity. Quality over quantity. Okay, making sure. So if I was going to start in tournament fishing and be brand new at this again, uh, for spinning rods, the first place I would start would be probably in the Dobbins lineup. They do a really good job with the 702s and 703s. So, uh, you know, for, for the folks at home that don't know, Dobbins does a really good job at numbering their rods. Of So for a 702, it's a seven foot, two power rod. So you know exactly what you're getting. Plus it has a taper, fast, extra fast on it, whatever. Um, and, and starting there. So I wouldn't buy something like, I wouldn't load the boat with like 15 ducat rods. I don't like them. They're, they break. I've broke every ducat rod I've ever owned. I've had excellent durability out of the Dobbins. And at the price point that they're in, now, I mean, they've went up $20 since I started buying these things, but still at that $130 price range, it's an awesome rod. I caught my biggest smallmouth ever on this rod. I've caught new, I'm, more fish than I can count on it. The 702 is a good place to start because I can do anything with this rod. I've thrown tubes on it, Ned rigs, wacky worms, the whole nine. So 
getting into tournament fishing as a young angler, somebody that, you know, doesn't have a ton of expendable income, getting rods that can do a lot of different things is key. So for this, I can do all my finesse applications with. It's a freaking awesome spinning rod for that. And if I were to have another one, it'd probably be a 703 for shaky heads and stuff, a little bit heavier. And then moving from there, I have a 705 CB Dobbins Fury crankbait rod. And like we just talked, from anything from 110 size jerk baits, 78 size jerk baits, DT6s, DT8s, all the way up to DT10s, rock crawlers, like that, that medium range crankbait jerk bait rod. It's excellent for that. I can even drop down and throw like pointer 78s on it uh, because I paired it with a Shimano SLX MTL, which has been almost, it casts almost like a BFS rod. We got what, four, but since they come out three years oh, wow. four years oh, yeah. behind these reels now that it's lasted that long it's just as smooth as the day i bought it comes in at it's 150 dollars price point so you're not really breaking the bank and it's just an awesome do everything medium size moving bait rod and then from there we started getting into a little more technique specific so i have a chatterbait spinnerbait rod it's a mega bass levante diablo spec r with a daiwa sv on it you don't have to go this expensive with with this style of fishing. The seven hundred five can do this thing. As well. Seven the Dobbins seven hundred five is one of the most versatile rods I've ever seen for any moving bait, whether it be single hook or. I don't think I'd want to go grass fishing with it, but like you know, yeah. if you're fishing normal Potomac, crankbaits, square bills, stuff like that, you can do a little bit of chatterbait fishing on, especially with the uh, stealth blades. Mm -hmm. You can do a lot of stuff on those rods. I think the first two are some of your most versatile rods possible. And I'd even bump down and say from the 733, 734, and 735, if you bought in that lineup, yeah. you would have no problem fishing. Because my favorite chatterbait rod right now is the 733. Not so much in grass because it has so much tip and so much load, it's hard to get that chatterbait out of grass. But I've thrown spinnerbaits on it and done well around hardcover. I fish chatterbaits around hardcover with that rod i have not had the problem of pulling it away from the fish everyone that eats it gets it um it's just an awesome lineup of rods and honestly as an you know introductory to tournaments with the dobbins even with the fury lineup you're getting high modulus graphite so they're super sensitive and they don't break the bank it's it's a good place to start now the levante of course comes in at about 250 dollars with a 200 dollars reel on it i mean it's I would say like a little more advanced step into it, but it's just a seven or it's a seven foot, two inch rod, medium heavy. It's got, it's a fast action. So it's got enough tip to where I can keep these fish pen or enough backbone to keep them pinned, but enough tip to where they really eat the bait. So it's a great rod to start with in a, in a length and a taper and a power when it comes to moving baits. And then we move in to getting a little more specific. So this is a six foot, eight inch, I think it, is it medium heavy. heavy? Mm -hmm. It fishes them as like a medium though. It's a little soft. It's a Phoenix K2, which is like their top of the line rod. Now, if going back, I would stay with the Fury lineup if I'm just getting into this with the Shimano SLXs. Even the bare bones SLX at $99 is an amazing reel. Uh, Shimano has pretty much cornered the market on that $99 price point because we're not mad at and tim from tactical we're not we're balling on a budget so yeah we have nicer stuff now because we've invested in this for so many years and we just built and built and built but that introductory setup uh, uh slx just a regular stock bare bones slx at 99 dollars with a fury coming in at 200 dollars would be awesome or even if you get the whole slx combo because there's a lot of lengths and tapers and sizes in those rods yeah. So I had this question. Um, I had an individual reach out to me over Christmas on Instagram about what uh, about a setup to get. And this is a question I'm going to start asking. I think more of my guests. If you had to put more money into it, would it be the rod or the, or the reel? The rod, definitely. Rod. 100%. Interesting. Okay. Because the reel does nothing for me sensitivity wise. It does nothing for me when it comes to being able to detect that bite to get the most out of my cast. Right. Because I can take this. Even at the lower price point, this Dobbins Fury High Mod, or this K2, or this Caden, or this Levante, and I can feel the grass. I can distinguish between bites. To me, the sensitivity from the rod matters more. I could take any of my SLXs that are just the stock bare bones SLXs and make just as good of a cast with it as I can my SVs or my Corrado MGLs, or you know, I got a Daiwa uh, Tatula 150. I've got, there's a metanium set in here. I can make just as good of a cast with the SLX and have just as good of a day of fishing that I can with that metanium. I think reels have come so far that it's almost out of the question. You're, 
your hundred dollar reel is so far advanced from what what a hundred dollar reel used to be. I mean, we you could probably take a fifteen year old Metanium and a ninety nine dollar SLX right now without fish that reel. They're just so advanced, and Shimano has definitely done the best at cornering that market because the dive with Fuego casting reels suck at that ninety nine dollar price point. I, I think for bait casters, definitely. I think it's. I am you know, so ugh. spinning reels. I don't own anything more than a hundred bucks. Yeah, spinning reels. It's weird. I feel like if if you are fishing, if all you're gonna fish is like the Shenandoah and like smallmouth country, where you're fishing four pound tests and stuff, that would be the only place I would be like, yeah, put more into the reel because you got to make sure you got buttery smooth drag. I, I think if you're fishing the tidal, yeah, like do you really need like an expensive reel? Not, no. not really. Like any like I have three Daiwa Revroses that are coming at like the fifty dollar price point. I have a Fuego. I have, oh crap, I think that might be it right now. I don't really have a lot of spinning gear, but he's fished a Stratic and got rid of the Stratic to buy these. Like, I mean, it, buy there wasn't that three much of a distance. For the Stratic. I love the Stratic, don't get me wrong, it is a nicer reel. It is a way nicer reel, but I didn't see enough to want to keep spending, what is it, two, uh, yeah, $200 40? now? Yeah, 240 200 something yeah. like that on spinning reels when I'm still, I'm fishing eight and 10 pound line. Yeah, and guys, this is what I like about this because it's just like the different like opinions and stuff. Because mine is like quantity over like quantity over the quality in the sense of if you want to get into this, having multiple rods is so important to be able to switch techniques. Where you know if you do spend the money on just like one or two, they're great. But then once you get into the tournament, you're not going to be as efficient with the switching. Yeah, you're spending time breaking yeah. down, cutting stuff. Cutting but that's and where retie, like these. Retie. What do I got here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven rods. I mean. Yeah, the sticker shock up front would kind of suck, but you can do anything on these seven rods. So if you buy it over you know a period of time, it's not that bad. But I have a rod that I can throw big glide baits on, uh, mag drafts, so big soft swim baits, a rigs, and that's the Denali Lithium Seven Eleven. It's an extra heavy, but I flipped on it. I've thrown punch rigs, you know, just regular flipping Texas baits, uh, bigger jigs, so grass jigs up to an ounce. I've thrown a rigs on it. I've thrown mag drafts. I've thrown glide baits. Everything on that rod. So what rods or oh, what techniques do you feel like if if you had to spend the money on a specialty niche thing? So for me, like the one specialty rod I have is a custom swim bait rod with a telescoping handle, so that way I can actually get more leverage. That's mm -hmm. about it. Where I think like that actually helps when you spend the money for that. For me, bottom contact definitely is is where I spend my money. That's where you'd go, okay? Because yeah, like moving baits, obviously like. You get that jarring bite sometimes in the right conditions. So you can really distinguish between, all right, that's mushy and that's grass or that's a fish that's biting. Now, when you get to the colder parts of the year, it, it could help. It, well, it could hurt more than help. But, I mean, you, you might just be crying and be like, all right, that's grass, that's grass, that's grass. Oh, man, I got a lot of grass. And go to rip it out, and you're like, oh, that's a fish. So any you get your return on investment with anything you buy. So it's like any anything else in life. You get what you pay for. Um, but if I had to really, really spend money on something that was like, I need this more than anything else would be something like this X pride. Cause that's a jig rod. That's all I throw on that rod is jigs. So football heads up to three quarters of an ounce flipping jigs from a quarter to five eighths. And that's it because when I'm fishing slow, I really need to distinguish between, all right, that's rock or that's mud or that's grass or, all right, that mud feels like a bite. Let me set the hook. So I need to detect that bite more with the bottom contact because you don't always get that good, hard, you know, thud. You know, sometimes you just pick it up and swim off with it. So really distinguishing between, you know, bottom contact and moving baits, my money goes into the bottom contact rods. But with this lineup, I mean, I have a, so a 7.11 extra heavy, a 7.1 medium heavy. So it's a 7.13, uh, three power. I got a 7.2 medium heavy. It's a 6.8 medium heavy, another 7.2 medium heavy, uh, 7.05 CB. So I think it's technically a medium heavy, but it's parabolic. It's a crankbait rod and then a seven foot medium light. So you're going to go parabolic with your crankbait rod? To an extent. I like a lot of tip and more backbone. So I don't like, I hate glass rods because they load way too deep. I don't get a good feel with glass rods uh, as opposed to graphite because uh, I'm, you know, if you're grinding in the rocks, you're grinding in the wood, you can feel that good, hard, distinguished, like, all right, this bill is really grinding these rocks and all of a sudden it's mushy and you get that soft crankbait bite. 
and I basically like you just let the tip do the work. Like you just swing through. It's not a hook set. You just pull into the fish, and they hook them up almost every time. What What are your guys' belief with with the chatterbait, crankbaits, even swim jigs about the idea of like you can be too sensitive? Like you could be so sensitive because you know like a, the, I, that's an old school thought there. I'm as sensitive as I can get. I just bought the IMX bladed jig rod. I want as sensitive as I can get. I, for me, I I agree that you should have most of your money in the bottom contact rods, but. I say that, but my most expensive rods are my jerkbait rod and my bladed jig rod. Um, to me, I want to put money where the baits out there the most. I want that to be the ultimate, most sensitive. Uh, whatever's locked in my hand all day, I want that to be most lightweight, most sensitive, most vers not versatile. It's just, it's the one I want to pick up. Now, for your blade, your bladed jigs, are you guys throwing it, like, what is the line set up? Are you going braid, fluorocarbon, mono? Like, Straight fluoro doing? for both of us. Really? Uh, you do 15, I do 20. Yeah. Oh, I'm wow. 20 on everything Why? bladed jig. I think it's, I think it hovers better. Um, I think when you pop out that grass, when you run it right into one of those milfoil clumps or whatever, you hit it, I don't think it does a nosedive. It'll kind of sit there and hover for a second. I think that's where I get a lot of my bites. I spend a lot of time fishing two to three foot of grass with it. And I think keeping it up a little bit higher is just, it makes a world of difference. So why not use braid then? Wouldn't braid be better for that? I just don't like braid. I think it's too noisy. I think it's too noisy. I think they can see it. I think that even if they can't see it, I think they feel it. I mean, you can hear it going yeah. through your guides and it just sounds like it grinds to me. Plus, I, I don't like braid for the fact that there's no stretch. Even if I do have a poly, or parabolic is, rod, I can rip yeah. that chatterbait away from those fish. Yeah, that's another thing. I throw a, a lot stiffer rod. Um mm. I think I would hurt myself if I did braid. I think I'd rip it out of their mouth every time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like I have, oh crap, four. Ch so I got the Levante. I have a seven six that I throw chatter baits on <laughs> for my bigger, like three quarter ounce jackhammers. I have, ah, oh, good lord, I got like four chatter bait rods, and they all do something a little different. So I go from fifteen to twenty pound test depending. I actually just picked this line up, and I'm hoping it's my answer. Uh, so it's uh, the Samurai J Floro Hidden Concepts. So it's got a 15 pound diameter and 18 pound test. I like the peace of mind of being able to get a freaking $20 jackhammer back to the boat no matter what. Mm -hmm. But I also, like like Matt just said, I like the idea that this is four different colors. So you got like a dark green, a light green, a light brown, a dark brown. So especially fishing around aquatic vegetation, I think this will help mm -hmm. more just to hide that line a little bit. Because, you know, at the Potomac, you go to a community hole with 200 boats sitting in it you got to have something a little bit different or to give you that advantage. And I think that's what fluoro does for us over braid is that, you know, the fish may not detect it as much. They have seen a thousand chatter baits. What's different about this one? Oh, I can't see anything attached to it. Let me eat that one. But I like the 15 for chatter baits just so I can get them a little bit deeper. Uh, the thinner diameter, I get a farther cast out of it, obviously. So maybe, you know, maybe my cast went 30 feet farther than the next person's. So that, that fish can track that bait longer before it decides to eat. I could see it maybe hit two additional clumps of grass and rip out of it, and then that'll give me that reaction bite. So, I mean, it's all personal dependency. But uh, going back to buying this stuff, take advantage of your Black Friday deals. Oh, my God, yes. A big yes. time. Like, Drink a little bit, too. It helps buy stuff. A hundred percent. Whatever you do, don't get too carried away because then the credit cards start cooking. <laughs> but uh, take advantage of it because I know, like, especially for me and i know he's the same way and i'm sure it's most men we're impulsive we see someone we gotta have it like all right this is the new latest and greatest i gotta have it but if you wait until black friday or memorial day sales or fourth of july sales and pick this stuff up you will save so much money especially on the necess necessities like the one thing guys and i and this is just for me i think you need to do is buy your line on black friday and get bulk. a big and ass bulk. spool of it especially if you throw a lot of spinning stuff with braid you can buy 30. a thousand yard spool and get a big uh, discount 34 dollars for that yeah so normally so this is cigar red label which is by far the best economic floor carbon ever for the price i mean black friday they drop these down i got a spool of 10 12 15 i think yeah 34 dollars a spool for a thousand yards that's awesome yeah. or you can wait till after black friday and get 200 yards for like 18 bucks mm -hmm. so and i could fill up reels all year long because every two to three tournaments we change the line the line is this, yeah. i mean i know you guys probably can't see it but the, the price on this is 150 dollars for a thousand yards of line which is it's insane sticker shock i mean you're like oh my god that's a lot of money but I paid 60 bucks for it on Black Friday. Plus, you don't understand, like, for things like that, um, it costs a lot then, but it's, like, saving you through, like, like, uh, like I don't know, like, like, like is... getting hooks, like, three-aughts. Like, you're going to go through those weights. You're going to lose those. Um, 
bobber stoppers for that. Like the little stupid shit like that that you know you're going to spend a lot on. Especially line. Line, Because it's something yeah. we don't think about. Mm-hmm. The amount of 200-yard spools I bought in yellow. Yeah, and then yes. you disgusting. don't even get a full spool of yeah. use out of it. You get one reel and you can't put that spool on another reel because then you got like a quarter spool. So to buy in bulk saves you in the long run. You're not you're paying more up front, but you're getting like I probably get two years worth of line, depending on how much I fish. But with that comes line care. So I got real magic sitting there. Uh to, to condition your line saves you money in the long run. So I can get probably I'd say one and a half times the longevity out of a spool by conditioning it than I would if I just let it go. And rod, uh, get get guys, get some rod sleeves too. I, I still see some people that don't buy them. If you're gonna invest this shit into this equipment, please get yourself a rod sleeve. Because I, I mean, I mean, Chris just did it too, and I did it when I walked in here. You you randomly you don't mean to, but then you shove the the last eye into the ceiling. Like, but if you have that sleeve, it just protects your investment, mm-hmm. and they're not expensive. Same way with real oil and grease and stuff. Yeah. I mean, just to take the time to sit down and not even break them all the way down, but just oil the like the worm gears and stuff, like the 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 most moving parts. Like you can just mm-hmm. pop a side cover off and hit all your bearings with some oil. Mm-hmm. But the maintenance, it's it's just like driving a vehicle. You're not going to go 100,000 miles on one oil change. You're going to stop and change your oil every 3,000 miles and take care of your vehicle and get that longevity out of it. I treat my fishing gear the same way. So I'll maintenance this stuff as I go. But going back to buying in bulk, I mean, it saves you in the long run. I got all these jigs. So Beast Coast Working Man jig is probably the most economical swim jig on the market right now for the quality that you get out of it. It's a freaking great jig for the price. And they're listed right around $4. Um... I got these on eBay for $2 and 20 cents a piece. Nice. But to scour these websites, use things to your advantage to save your money as best as possible because you still got to pay entry fees. You still got to pay, put gas in the boat. You got to do all this stuff. So to save money on this is key because, you know, I got 30 of these things for 60 bucks. Scour eBay, like the, the stealth blades land here. I paid $6 a piece for those. Whew. So I, I paid swim jig prices less than the cost of an evergreen grass ripper for $15, $16 what chatter did we get? Jackhammers at $4 a piece this year? Yeah, and that's wow. another thing. Yeah. Look for when websites mess up because uh, what's curated? Yeah. Listed all their jackhammers for like 4 bucks a piece. And that's why we got 40 and 50 of them. Yeah. Because why not? <laughs> So, like, I mean, with that, let's pivot to, like, again, the chatterbait thing, because I, I keep I keep asking this to everyone, because I think it's fascinating. We get, like, a thousand different, like, point of views on this. Is the chatterbait ever going to get, like, the Whopper Plopper had a great run. The the Umbrella Rig had a great run where everyone could catch 30 pounds with it. Is it ever going to get to the point where, like, maybe the swim jig or something else becomes the hot bait because everybody and their brother in the same grass mat are throwing a chatterbait again and again and again? Like, do you think the fish are ever going to get educated, especially at the Potomac River, where it is where you throw a chatterbait? If they haven't yet, I don't know when they're going to. We're on how many years in a row of this? And... I mean, chatterbaits came out in, what, the early 2000s? Mm-hmm. Like, right around 2000 at Okeechobee, Skeet Reese, and all those guys has really turned these things Davey on. Baby height, we, yeah. Yeah, we've been catching fish on them ever since. I don't know that it's going to be a conditioning thing to the bait itself just because the mechanics behind it and how it keys in on that lateral line and dirty water and the the visual approach now with these like super nice hand tied skirts that Z-Man does. I don't think the bait itself will ever die. I think when it comes back to what me and him were just talking about with the tinkering between the line sizes and the colors of line and, you know, what our rod selection and stuff is and how we fish them is more key than the actual bait itself. Like the umbrella rig will never die. There's still dudes catching sixty pound limits in Texas on these. Yes, but it's not like where it used to be. When you know you would just don't hear about it as much anymore. Which again, I think it comes down like for example is like with forward facing sonar. You're seeing more articles written like the fish are now wary. They get it now. It's like Mm -hmm. for some reason when I hear clicking, I get I disappear. It's like so they're learning, and that's where I think because again, like I want to get in this too. You fish a swim jig, but not your chatterbait. So why? When, when do you do that? Because I think the swim, I think the swim jig is a very stealthy presentation that yeah. a lot of people you either do it or you don't, but it's not talked about. I spend I spend my year at the Lower Potomac looking for new grass. I find that if you go down around Leesylvania, that grass starts first before you go up what river and go up to uh, Brian's Point. I think the grass starts farther or starts sooner farther down. Um, I will take that swim jig and I think a lot of people down there fish that swim jig very high in the water column, at least high to middle. It is on the bottom. You're going to give up your secret? A little bit. I don't know. Um, I think that swim jig, I think people throw it on too heavy of a line. I think they're throwing it on, I think a lot of people throw it on 20, 25, or braid, and they're trying to rip it through these grass clumps. I do something way different. I do 10 to 15 max um, Hmm. and fish it underneath of that grass. 
if you can get down now you can't be fishing matted grass with a finesse swim jig but if you can go find that new grass and you get it down there with them i think they're so conditioned to that swim jig coming above their head when it's right down there next to them i think they eat it a lot better um that and finding a finding a trailer that really makes that swim jig work a secondary action that secondary yeah. that's that's been the biggest thing i use a rage crawl i know a lot of people like uh Kai text, but yeah. to me, I, I don't, swear by rage crawls. Yeah, yeah. rage yeah. crawls. Well, it is all I and use. That's the same with our chatter baits too. I do don't. You, do you die the tips? No, it, depending on where I'm at. Lower Potomac, no. I have a very. Do I need to edit this out? Like, yeah, <laughs> I have a very specific swim jig. I throw down there a very specific rage crawl that I throw. But like, if I go to Little Pool, yes, I die everything. Little chartreuse. You can look right down in the water. All the bluegill down there. Are oh yeah. Bright char chartreuse tails and fins on them uh lower return i can throw more yellow perch it's a lot more you know your oranges and stuff like that on there um but no braid for that that's interesting okay no braid. no braid i'm beginning of the year it might be on it i could throw a swim jig on a spinning rod as weird as that sounds but i'm throwing on mm -hmm. a 10 pound line 10 12 later in the year i'll go to 15 when obviously you can't get away with lighter so line, you're but slow rolling it like a swim bait is basically what you're doing i try to yeah. i've always thought of it, it's like a crankbait underneath the grass it's still a moving bait it still has a lot of action but it's underneath of it mm -hmm. that's where the secondary action comes in too because the trailer that he picks is uh you know not only are you getting the claws the action from the claws but you get it like a side to side roll with it mm -hmm. so it highlights the colors in the skirt a little bit better uh it just works. It's something that he turned me on to that I was like, you know, like everybody else, I got to fish over the grass so I don't get hung up in it. But the way that the swim jigs heads are designed, depending on which ones, you know, that more narrow head design will really just pull right through that grass without getting caught up in it. And you can fish it to the roots where these fish are, especially mm -hmm. in the colder months, like the spring of the year. I never would have thought, you know, I'm catching fish on swim jigs in 40 degree water. But if you fish where they are, because it's the only structure they have in most of these creeks is a lot of grass, and you drag it through the bottom of that, you're putting it right in their face. They have no choice and but to react. Or and it's clean react. down there. When you get to the bottom of that root system, it's clean. It doesn't have all this branching off stuff. It's it's You have, I don't know how much, but you know, a foot of water there where there's no leafy vegetation coming off. They're just sitting down there, and you're bringing it right in front of their face. It's I, so, I think it's more subtle, too. Yeah. Like, I really think... And I, I do not, guys, forewarn, I have never thrown a chatterbait. I've thrown it very rarely. I'm a 100% swim bait, swim jig guy. Nerd. Um, I know, right? <laughs> like, my brother loves it. I don't. But it's like, I think nothing resembles a bluegill more than a swim a swim jig. Because yep. if you've watched a, a, a chatterbait, just looks like a coked out junkie running through there. Mm -hmm. Whereas a swim jig, it just, the how subtle it is. And if you can balance it right, this is what I do. When you pause it, it's not going to drop immediately. It just sits there for a second because bluegill will stop and mm -hmm. they act, you know, retarded and stuff. And I think if you're a bass, you're sharking that thing. And if you see it drop like a rock, I think if it's a shad, that might work to get that reaction. But I think they like it when it pauses like a bluegill or crappie would mm -hmm. and they can just come up and inhale it. Well, that's why he throws 20 pound tests, like he said earlier, is yeah. when he pauses that chatterbait, it mm -hmm. doesn't drop like a rock. It just kind of hovers right there. Then with 20, you can also fish it a lot slower. Yeah. It's not coming through the water at 100 miles an hour. Yeah. I mean, we're I'm still fishing fairly fast, but you can you can slow it way down. You can go down to, I mean, you can say you're half balanced, you're going slow. As soon as it hits that clump of grass, it just hovers. And I think, it, like Chris said, I think you're getting that same type of presentation to where it just sits there and they have to eat it. Mm -hmm. um, that's been the minute. I don't even think I fished a chatterbait before I met Chris. No. And I, I can live with it now. It, it took me a long time. It took a lot of uh, experimenting back and forth. I mean, I used to try to fish them with Kytex. I think switching to crawls has been our biggest. Been the biggest. Because not only, you know, with the crawl, you got a more compact presentation. So if I take this chatterbait here and I put a green pumpkin Kytex on it, the tail's going to hang down way below the hook point. Mm -hmm. So I've made this presentation way more compact. So when they eat, the, they eat all of it. They don't just bite at the tail or I don't get the short strikes. I honestly couldn't tell you the last time I had a bite and missed it on a chatterbait because they just eat the entire thing yeah it, it's so weird the whole trailer thing because i when i fish a swim jig though at kerr or i'm fishing the shad run i don't know why but if i go all white on my swim jig with a big trailer it works and it's literally i think honestly what it is when we're fishing those shorter trailers it's because we are not trying to match them shad those bigger baits it's because the bait on title is usually compact except the conditions in which you have like you know like again a mag draft bite or something like that um i think it's so weird because like online and this is where it's like you guys you either you know or you know 
if you fish a swim jig like like you hear like on tactical bass and stuff, I think that works if it's a shaddish bait. But if it is very specific to tidal estuaries, not just the Potomac, the bait is usually more compact that they're actually pursuing. And it all depends on where, you're, like in the creeks, it's uh, like white perch are very panfish shaped, mm -hmm. yellow perch, bluegills, crappies. You all got this short, stumpy, little wide fish. Whereas you know, shad are longer, more narrow. So like when I go to Anna. If I, unless I'm in a creek, in the back of a creek, and I'm fishing grass or fishing wood or anything like off the main leg, that's where your bluegill like to dwell, stuff like that. Uh, unless I actually mark a school of crappie that I have fish actively feeding on, I'll go to a swim bait style or a more finesse swim bait style, like a hog farmer, a uh, spunk shad, or like a, a Zayco. I know mm -hmm. he doesn't really like the Zayco, but I love the Zayco. When you're keyed on those longer and more narrow bait fish, I just find that the Zayco gets me more bites and bigger bites. Uh, it's still a finesse style trailer. I don't have that big, wide, thumping tail. This is a little shimmy in the back because I've never seen a bluegill where it looks like a freaking yeah. wagging the dog tail behind it. They all have that narrow shimmy when mm -hmm. they swim. So that's where I opt for like the uh, the Zaycos or the uh, the Lake Fork, um, the Hyper Shad, I think. Yeah. The segmented body with the flat tail uh just i, I try to stray, stray away from paddle tails as much as po uh, possible because of the popularity of them and how many people are throwing them it's hard because like if you're if you are on a bluegill or crappie bite it's the bulk too it, it, and that's where i think the swim jig it just it nothing else on the market unless you get like a matt allen like lure like custom swim bait there's something so bulky about a bluegill or a crappie and it's how again i feel like my personal belief people don't fish slow enough because if you're fishing a shad based bite, which most of the country does, yeah, shad move. But crappie and bluegill are so, they're not afraid of bass. And I think that's why the secondary action is so important on a swim jig. If you've ever like been to a pond and you watch, bluegill will sit around a bass. It's when it just does something a little bit different all of a sudden, the bass reacts. And I think that's what happens. You're slow rolling that thing and it hits something. And then it makes that plume or deflection and the bass have to go crazy on it. But if you're just trying to like crank that thing like a shad, I think they recognize that, like that doesn't seem right. It doesn't look natural to them. Yeah, but who the hell? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like I, I could take the swim jig and make it anything I want to make it, right? So mm -hmm. I can do the uh, what do they call it? Not the hover strolling because that's with the soft plastics, but like the the, the jackal bee swoles or whatever. Yeah. Uh, they got a name for where they just put like a split tail trailer in the back of it, and they almost work it like a jerk bait. So I can get that narrow profile for shad with that, or I can take a reaction innervation spicy beaver and it's a big bulky beefy profile and make this jig a panfish pattern <laughs> or i can go down and i can take you know like a little like white split tail and have that shad pattern with it and make it narrow and that's a big thing too with with jigs especially swim jigs is they're on the bottom that skirt's flaring out mm -hmm. kind of like the gills on a bluegill and giving it more bulk so i think that's why his technique works yeah that swim jig man i don't know i just feel like if i had to pick one to fish a year like I would probably be a swim jig versus a chatterbait because even then, like you put a rage crawl in the back, you could still skip that under docks, work it, and then bring it back. Yep. I, I don't know. It's like, well, I mean, Chris, what do you think? Like chatterbait or swim jig? What's more versatile? So you have to pick one. I'm going to give you one. You have to fish it all wise, year. Swim jig, but what I'm going to pick is going to be a chatterbait. I know. That's, what, that's, that's my. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like every podcast I'm on here, that's what I'm talking about: chatterbait yeah. fishing. But. I, I agree with swim jigs being more versatile because especially this one, this is the uh, uh, evergreen grass river. I fish it through grass perfectly fine like he does. And I've also skipped it under docks. And I mean, I could basically turn it into just a lift and drop swim jig technique. Uh, so it's almost like a brush jig at that point or anything else. So versatility wise, definitely a swim jig, but I still get more bites on the chatter bait. I still throw it more. And I don't know if that's a confidence thing or if it's just, you know, right place, right time. But like you can still skip chatter baits and fish docks with it and you can still do a lift and drop. It's all situational dependent. But if I had to pick one to wear day in and day out that I know I could get bit or bites, no matter the water temperature, water clarity, whatever, it, swim jig, well, definitely. Just because of the versatility. I can make it a bait fish. I can make it a pan fish. I can make it a crawfish. I can do whatever I want to do with it. Uh, whereas the chatter bait, I mean, you're either bluegill and crappy or, I mean, you could, I've seen people fish it like a jig. It's just not my preferred method of doing so. And I just don't think at that point I would get as much bites on that as I would a swim jig. 
Guys, yeah, this has been freaking awesome. I mean, I think we're approaching like the two and a half hour mark here. Like, I mean, <laughs> I mean, Matt, let's start with you. Do you got any other things, closing thoughts, any people you want to, uh, sponsors you want to do a shout out? No, I let Chris handle all the sponsor work for us. <laughs> 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 He's the big talker. Uh, I just really appreciate you having us on today. Oh. It's been a great time. I mean, like, yeah, if you guys ever want to get on the show, and again, guys, I am so backlogged with guests, and then I'm trying to fish too and fish tournaments. Please message me if you want to be on the show. I'll get you on there. You have to hound me a little bit because I'm just overworked right now. But again, it's not me trying to be mean or whatever if I don't get back to you immediately. You guys are more than welcome to come on the show again, Chris. I mean, whenever you win a tournament this year, which will probably be the next five minutes, just like <laughs> give me a call and we'll we'll have you back on. Yeah, man. But uh, you got a sponsor too, right? Uh, not really sponsored, more of a partnership. Uh, a buddy of mine has a very, very popular food truck in the Martinsburg area. He's going to be mobile this year, so he'll be out and about. But uh, Food by Fire in Martinsburg, uh, shout out Sean. He's the owner, him <laughs> and his wife. I mean, they they do an awesome job. There's, I don't know, they, they used to be set up at a brewery, and I wouldn't even go and drink. I would just go and get food. It's that good. Um, and just going back to the buy local thing, support your local, your tackle shops like Jake's and, you know, if your friends have businesses, I'd rather give my, my buddy money than in, in any chain mm -hmm. of anything. I don't care if Johnny Morris ever gets another cent of my money, but Jenny will definitely at least once a week take my credit card. <laughs> That's just the way it's got to be. So I guess my biggest plug would be to shop local. And uh, yeah, I appreciate you having us. Yeah, no, no problem, guys. And then the last thing is, what are your goals for this year so we can look back on it and judge you for it? Chris, go first. Give me one goal for this year. One goal? Yeah, oh, one goal. Good Lord, I got a lot of goals. Could, could give a couple. All right, so obviously we got to break our PBs again. So okay. small mouth is five pounds, 13 ounces, so I need a six plus. And I'm still chasing that double digit large mouth. Um, didn't get a weight on my PB on that, so I, it's open for debate. So seven to 10 pound large mouth. Um, I don't know, win more tournaments than I won last year. Because you won like eight? Around Three last Three? year. Oh, okay. I'm one now. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Brady out here. <laughs> Nah, I just, uh, I think my main goal is not just to win, but to win big. Like, <laughs> I don't, like, it's one thing to what win. What the hell it's does a, that even mean, like, win big? Like, set records, man. Like, that, that picture uh, right there, that, that's <laughs> the club record for the most weight on that body of water. So, like, yeah, you can win a tournament, but who remembers that? I want to do stuff that I'm like, all right, you know, 20 years from now, people are like, hey, man, you remember when you broke the weight record on Racetown? Just stuff to, to, to be in the annals of history, I guess. Like, I want I want to do it as big as possible. And even right. if I win, hey, it's a plus. Even if I don't break that record, I still won. So we're we're shooting for the moon this year. Thank you, Ricky Bobby. Uh, Matt, <laughs> hey, you, you got any other rings? Be the, best uh, the, only th the <laughs> biggest goal I have this year. This will be the first year that I'm going to try to fish all eight of the Potomac teams, and my goal is to hopefully win the year in. That is, it's a big one, but I think I can get enough consistency there that that's. That's my goal for the year. Whew. Just finally fish all eight of them and see how I can do at it. I think you're going to do fine. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is so. just There's showing up every day. Down there. You just got to show up every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. swinging for the fences, man. I didn't hear spend more money at Jake's. Oh, yeah, you know, obviously. That's a, given. We'll, yeah, that's a given. I don't know how much money I don't know why you don't spend. keep our credit yeah. card on on record. We're we're enslaved to Jake's bait and tackle. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like a, a wage garnishment every time I get a paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, again, follow them on social media. All of their socials, everything will be linked in the episode description. Give them a follow. Please like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.